After a successful 1995, it's time to start talking about Windows games from 1996. And there were a lot of them. I mean, just see for yourself. Free Schools of the Toltecs is a Western-themed point-and-click adventure game. You're Fenimore Fillmore, and by a set of quite unfortunate events depicted in a fully animated intro, you learn about free schools that can unlock the mythical and supposedly great treasure of the Toltecs. So naturally, you're so into it. And set out to find all free schools necessary to find it, and then treasure itself. You're not alone in those pursuits, however, as there are others after it too. So whomever will get to it first will become obscenely rich. The game uses a similar technology to LucasArts' scam engine, with screen divided in two, gameplay window on top and smaller one with command verbs and inventory at the bottom. And it's a tried and tested formula, so there's no reason to change something that just works. After a certain portion of the overworld map is uncovered, it can be used for fast travelling. You can however also ride the donkey or hand pump train trolley if you'd like. So there's that. While most puzzles are inventory based, you are giving few choices of answers in many conversations and this can actually affect the progress of the game. So, if you're into adventure games and never knew of free schools of Toltecs, it should definitely be on top of your two playlist. 3D Ultra Pinball Creep Night is a collection of three different horror themed pinball tables from Sierra, and it's excellent. And also I lied, but only a little, because there is hidden fourth table that can be unlocked while playing. But on the face value, there's only three, so let's stick to that. And all of them look great in high-res SVGA presentation and near lifelike 3D. In 1996, Crypt Knight was easily the best-looking pinball game out there. Beautifully animated table elements and numerous extra minigames paired with often multiple balls on the screen at once make up for a super smooth and fast gameplay that's as addicting as best pinball games can be, real or otherwise. Crypt Knight's sound design is top-notch too. All the samples are great fit to the spooky, dark and nightmare presentation and coupled with earlier mentioned graphics, make up incredible package that all fans of the genre should own and play, even today. It's worth pointing out that as all other 3D Ultra pinball games, this one too does not focus on realism, but on fun. So plenty of extra side tables, minigames and physics-defying features are included. It may be a turn-off for some, but I love it. Up to 4 players can play 3D Ultra Pinball alternating. Crypt Knight is a game that just works amazing whenever there's few of you around and you can't agree on a game to play. Just run it, let people try it out and witness how all of them will enjoy it. I doubt that anyone would find a reason to complain about it. 9. The Last Resort is a surreal first-person viewpoint and click adventure game mechanically similar to Myst. And not unlike it, most of your time is spent searching for clues and solving various logic or musical puzzles. There are often weird mechanisms and contraptions too, so if you're accustomed to Myst's gameplay, you'll feel right at home in 9. The main story revolves around you having inherited an old mysterious large mansion and having to get rid of nine evil muses that have taken it over in recent years. The strange environments of the mansion feel alive, creepy, like an old amusement park that has been long abandoned and partly reclaimed by nature. Sadly, other than the literal one-liner I just told you, there's not much story in 9. That said, fun and involving puzzles more than make up for it and stellar cast of voice actors makes it a must-play. I mean, you get to listen to greats such as Robert De Niro, Cher, James Belushi and Christopher Reeve among others. And it's something that was definitely not the norm in 1996 in gaming. Interestingly enough, the cast is a result of game being made by Robert De Niro's own development studio, so yeah, back in the day he did invest in some of the more modern entertainment rather than just movies. Aten Cuba is a successor to earlier Aten Attack and it puts you behind simulated cockpit of an Aten Thunderbolt 2 once again, this time over painstakingly modeled island of Cuba, to the point that none of the missions is constrained to a smaller piece, a region of the island, and you have a complete freedom of movement. You can actually forfeit your tasks and fly around the whole map that looks and feels as if it was alive, at least by mid-90s standards. So there's buildings where you'd expect them to be in reality, trucks drive around, ships dock in and out of ports, and even random enemies may attack you just because you're in a foreign military craft over their country. It's grounded in realism. The very same can be said about the simulation aspects of the game. The physics are as real as they could be in 1996, and the flight dynamics are excellent. The damage model is great too, and only the parts of the plane that actually get damage in combat will be affected by it, with bits and pieces flying off even if appropriate to sustain damage. If that wasn't enough, the cockpit features many buttons and switches that you can actually click to toggle, and not just use keyboard shortcuts. And all that, coupled with the fact that there's no radar, as it's an old ass plane, makes up for very exciting and challenging gameplay in which you have to be on top of your game all throughout or face the consequences. There's 12 missions included, but sadly they don't form any real campaign and are all completely standalone, which may not be an issue for most, but to me feels like a bit of a wasted opportunity, as you lose that experience of progression other games serve. But that's not a big issue really, it's just how the game's made. What was its biggest problem though was that it was ported from Mac, where it released a year earlier. 
and by 1996 on PC we had 3D acceleration everywhere. Both cheap and more expensive cards seemed to be popping up left and right like flowers after rain and we were getting used to high color, smooth and not jagged presentation. Aiden Cuba came from a system that was not using this at the time whatsoever and it was a straight up conversion. As a result it looked dated basically on arrival. Well I say straight up conversion but an excellent mission editor present in Mac original was entirely omitted for PC and it more than made up for lack of campaign or visuals. Still, even without it, if you're a fan of air combat simulations, A10 Cuba is a title you should not miss. If you're not, then maybe start your adventure with them with a different game. AD Cup is your typical early 3D rail shooter. You're a cup and you're out to get the bodies. Basic stuff really. Yeah, well, it may not be the best of game story backgrounds, but it is what it is. We've sure seen wars, haven't we? Anyway, the game is divided into six missions, each of them split into three smaller stages with a boss at the end. There's only three of these missions available as you first launch the game and the remaining ones are unlocked while playing. The arsenal of choice or lack thereof that you start with is a standard police issued gun and a bazooka of rather unknown origin. But you do get to pick up weapons from the fallen enemies so there's more than the starting set to choose from in the end. While AD Cup is not much than a weaker copy clone of Virtua Cup, it's a pretty decent one so if you like the genre you'll love it. AD2044 is a point and click adventure game with a very unusual premise. In the not so far off future, a group of radical women revolutionists hijacked nuclear missiles and demanded to be able to share the power that the men held over the world. Fair request if you ask me. Everyone wants a piece of the pie, right? Since the response was negative, however, women launched the nukes to which men responded with their own counter launch. Now, there is a lot of logical errors in this story, like dozens in these two sentences alone, but for the sake of how interesting and unusual it is otherwise, I will not point them out. So, today, or not today, but in the present of the game's grim future, the world lies in ruin, right? As most missiles hit their targets, effectively eradicating life on the planet. But not entirely, it seems, as a lone thousand women in a remote location, originally on a conference of some sort, survived. And after the dust settled, they formed all-female, not that they had any choice in the matter since they were the only ones left, underground society. They hid from radiation and survived on their own. A little while later, in 2044, during a routine mining operation, a capsule with preserved hibernated men is uncovered. He's not only still alive, but also the last man on Earth. AD 2044 is a Polish game and it takes in heaps from earlier old Polish cult sci-fi movie called Sex Misja, which translates to Sex Mission, if that's not obvious enough, and has nearly identical plot, at least up to this point. In AD 2044 you play as that man who escaped the captivity and tries to find his way out of this crazy world. Now, I bet all that sounds hella interesting to you, right? I'm Batman. No bros, there's no cat women society anywhere. Sorry guys, he's just curious. Still, I gotta disappoint you, the game is not particularly good. Aside from what I just told you, the story is very superficial and nearly non-existent. The puzzles are mostly inventory and item combining based, but will require a lot of tedious and worst of all, unmarked pixel hunting to find and pick up the right items. The humor is a bit stale and very very odd. On the other hand, so is this channel, so you may very well be used to it. Despite all I just told you, you won't really get to meet any women. Only women-shaped androids. So yeah, it's not great. Fans of the genre will probably hunt it down and complete it despite all I just said, but others can pretty much skip it altogether. I was unsure if I should even talk about AI Wars The Insect Mind here, all because I'm torn between considering it a game at all and an educational software, and I avoid covering educational games. For the most part, there are some outliers obviously. Anyway, for the sake of the video, let's agree that it's a game. So, it's all about combat, about creating battle machines called cybugs and placing them in battles against other similar machines. So you have to create your cybug, equipping it with various useful in combat items like shields, mines, missile launchers, guns, grenades, energy dischargers, scanners, cloak devices and even self-destruct unit. And you have to do it in a way that will not only take ammo and fuel use under consideration, but also heat. You wouldn't want your cyborg to overheat mid-combat and fail now, would you? When all that's done and you've made your first awesome and deadly shiny cyborg, the real game begins. And no, that's not action-packed arcade romp against others. Nothing of the sort. It's programming. Yes, you heard that right, programming. Because without the proper software, your cyborg is just an immovable shell, a book and piece of steel with guns sticking out of it. So, using a so-called CAICL language, similar to BASIC, you have to write an algorithm of behavior for your cyborg that will make it the best, the strongest and most deadly cyborg that there ever was. Now, when you're done and your keyboard managed to cool down from all the typing, you're ready to pit your cyborg against either a different one made by yourself or a friend or one downloaded off the internet. And the battle plays out in 2 or 3D on an enclosed battlefield. 
Once it's complete, you're given a printable rundown of the whole encounter along with scores. It can be used to optimize and modify your cyborg build or programming to make it even better. In the end, AI Wars is robot design and programming and it's most fun if you have a friend who's also into it, so that you could keep trying different builds against each other. Playing it alone against downloaded or even old designs gets old quite fast, sadly. Ace Ventura is beautifully presented an animated point-and-click adventure game based on TV cartoon, which in turn was itself based on a movie duology by the same title. You play as Ace, who's, well, a pet detective. And you'll do precisely that, you'll fight four animal-hating villains, you'll rescue endangered species, gather clues and solve not always logical puzzles. As a matter of fact, if you're ever stuck in Ace Ventura and don't know what to do, try doing things you wouldn't have done otherwise. The crazier, the better. And while it may sound stupid, it is actually a pretty useful hint when it comes to this game. Anyway, the game is obviously filled with humor to the brim and hilarious situations seem to spawn behind every corner, so you will find yourself chuckling often at some of Ace's comebacks or commentaries. That said, the humor leans towards more adult themes, it's not obscene or overly sexualized in any shape or form, but jokes will most likely land for a bit older audiences than preteens. While Ace Ventura is completely linear, the ever-present craziness, stupid jokes and over 60 unique and interesting locations make it a fun and involving experience all the way through, even if for a single playthrough. And because of that, I will go out of my usual way and recommend it to anyone, not only point-and-click lovers. Oh, and while the game received only average scores all around the world, being considered solid but not special in any way, in Poland out of all places it was beloved and gained small but still cult following. Afterlife is LucasArts' humorous sandbox strategy slash economic simulation game. You build and manage heaven and hell simultaneously, and in it you have to prepare appropriate zones. In hell they're based on seven capital scenes, and in heaven they center around seven virtues. New souls arrive through gates regularly and go to the respective areas that they belong to, to receive punishments or rewards for the former lives. For them to reach their destinations, however, you need to make sure to have a working street system that's connected to specific facilities. Souls that have no way of getting to where they're supposed to, wander around the hell or heaven aimlessly, and it's bad for business. Cause yeah, it's an economic simulation at heart after all. And since all souls are your source of income, those that have no place to go, after a while of wandering, are irreversibly sent back to Earth. All the buildings require personnel to operate and this can either be trained in training facilities or hired. Afterlife is a really interesting concept that is actually pretty well realized, with a lot of micromanagement, economic challenges and random disasters. If you like the genre, definitely give it a shot and don't sleep on it, because while the premise may seem unusual, that's what's best about it. Miss arrival on the gaming scene, whether you liked its gameplay loop or not, was important for many reasons, one of them being spawning number of similarly looking or playing games. And while many of them were disappointing, some weren't. And Amber Journeys Beyond was definitely one of the better ones inspired by it. It's a first-person horror adventure and tells the story of Dr. Roxana, who created astral mobility by electronic resonance device, in short, Amber, and uses it in the seemingly haunted mansion she moved into to conduct her experiments to confirm the hauntings and presence of eternal beings. Soon after she does, however, all the contacts with her cease and this is where you come in. You're asked to investigate what happened and most importantly, find her. So you have to traverse the mansion, learn all its secrets, use the Amber device to communicate with the ghost by lucid dreaming, help them, and with each ghost story solved, you'll be a step closer to figuring out how to help Roxana. There's quite a few inventory and mechanical puzzles in Amber, but the emphasis is put on storytelling and learning everything you can about the mansion and its ghost inhabitants. I'm not the biggest fan of Myst-style gameplay, even if I understand its popularity and appeal, but Amber is actually kinda interesting, especially in how it puts the dreamy sequences storytelling at its forefront. It's a breath of fresh air and something that you may like too. Amok is a futuristic sci-fi from behind the back action shooter that takes place on the planet of the same name. The planet has been long ravaged by the war between two opposing gigantic corporations, both bent on annihilating the other and controlling the planet itself. After close to five decades of continuous war, a fragile peace is reached and people can finally breathe with a hope for a better future. Or so it seems, cause enter you. Or to be precise, you under a direct order from a third company, one that supplies mercs and gear and was secretly killing it in profits all throughout the conflict, taking huge contracts from both sides. And it's not in their best interest for this piece to last. So you, in their most advanced and custom-made bipedal robot walker, are sent to disrupt the peace and reignite the conflict so that the war would resume. I'm Batman! I know, I too thought that they were upstanding and trustworthy. But here you go, you always learn these things last. So, um, yeah. I'm disappointed in you. Former savior of the universe and knight in a shiny armor defending virginity of numerous princesses in the respective towers in the respective castles. You used to be good, and now 
Anyway, your despicable self is sent on various linear missions to complete series of objectives of increasing difficulty. So you'll be destroying military bases, power generators, landmines, infantry, tanks and submarines of various kinds and even some of the local to the planet aggressive fauna. Even if I'm still seriously disappointed with you, I have to admit that Amok as a game is really fun. It perhaps wasn't the best shooter in 1996, but it was a blast even if it did not use any 3D hardware acceleration. Oh, and it featured really fun couch split screen co-op and deathmatch modes, so if you have a buddy with you and he's as evil as you are, you can both chip into the destabilization of the peace accords. Area 51 originated in the arcades before being ported to PC and all the major 32-bit consoles of the time. And as the title may suggest, it takes place in the infamous Area 51, where supposedly all the captured aliens were held. Whether they were or not, Area 51 is chock full of them serving as enemies and it's an on-rail first-person crosshair shooter that's action-packed and will keep your mouse's wheel red-hot from all the aiming and shooting you'll be doing. Unless you play it with a modern mouse, then nothing will happen to it. Even better, if there's two of you, you can team up to kick even more alien butt and send them back where they came from, wherever that is. And that's how Area 51 should be really experienced, as it shines with someone else there with you to share all the wins and losses. Alone, while not bad, pales in comparison to much clearer and better looking high res games in the same genre, such as Virtua Cup for instance. Area 51 is not a bad game, in fact it's great if you play with someone else, alone, it's average at best and a decent fun for one or two playthroughs at most. Still, if you're a fan of the on-rail genre, you shouldn't skip it. Asterix and Obelix is an arcade game based on the famous French series of comic books of the same title. It's not the beat-em-up you saw in the arcades though, even if its graphics quality is on a similar level, very cartoony, colorful and with beautifully drawn vibrant backgrounds, it is more of a side-scrolling action platformer, where you task with finding various artifacts all throughout the Europe, and on the way as usual for these titular goals you'll encounter thousands of romans to beat up, many boars to eat and numerous magical potions to drink. It's funny how the two heroes attract these enemies and items wherever they go in the world, isn't it? All in the straight from the comic book fashion. And you can play as either of the two or as both, with a friend in a co-op multiplayer. Which once again obviously is the best way of experiencing the game. With a friend sharing wins and losses, like two real goals would. So eating roasted boars and drinking questionable elixirs that may or may not have been spiced with hallucinogens. Most likely they have though. Asterix and Obelix is clearly aimed at fans of the graphic novels they originated from and younger audience, as it's pretty semi and repetitive. Meaning that while the levels change the way they look, they all play more or less the same and in about 30 to 45 minutes you'll be able to experience everything that the game has to offer, other than the locations. It's a waste of an opportunity, but if I'm to be frank, it's not a bad game and I've played many that were much worse. Baldis is a real-time strategy originally developed for the ill-fated Atari Jaguar, a first fake 64-bit system, and in 1996 ported to PC. Why was it fake? Well, it was not using a 64-bit chip, but rather two 32-bit ones, and people in the marketing, rather than reading up on how bits work, it shouldn't take more than 5-6 minutes, I must add, did a very basic math adding the two and coming up with an impressive sounding number that meant literally nothing. But you don't care about that, you wanna learn about the game. Your main goal in Baldis is to develop and manage a community of your small bold followers and to defeat opposing group of so-called Harrys. Because of course enemies of naturally bold folk had to be lush haired beautiful people. Game logic. Anyway, Baldis is a mixture of a god game and real time strategy with some simulation elements thrown in for a good measure. It is composed out of 20 levels divided into 5 worlds, each with its unique theme and progressively increasing difficulty, so you'll expand your tribe, though I'm not sure I should call it a tribe, really community sounds better, so yeah, you'll expand your community by erecting buildings, placing your baldies in specific rooms and then assigning jobs or tasks to them. The color of the robe that the baldie then wears signifies what job was assigned to it. There are 4 types of baldies overall. Red, which are workers, blue that can upgrade and maintain your initial house and other structures, grey that are soldiers and can be equipped with weapons, and finally white who are scientists that research and develop new inventions and weapons. These roles can be changed by dropping baldies into rooms of other jobs, completely nullifying what we know from real life about education, experience and acquiring knowledge. Never mind. Because despite this little annoyance, Baldis is a very unique and fun game that's much easier to understand while playing rather than listening in about it. Bedlam is an isometric action shooter set in the futuristic sci-fi Battle Mech universe. And just to be clear, I know nothing about Battle Mech universe. So I'll be spitting names that mean literally nothing to me for the next minute or so. So, your squad of three, pilots, a huge remote assault tank, in short rad, and is pitted against the mutated monsters called Biomechs, that took over human installations. How and when they did just that is irrelevant, but it's easy to guess who's tasked with clearing the Biomechs. I'll give you a hint, it both. 
and Swift and is pronounced you. Anyway, the easiest way to describe Bedlam would be to compare it to Crusader No Remorse or Crusader No Regret that we spoke about in earlier DOS videos. With a difference that you're not going around a huge complex but are exploring an isometric map filled with various bodies. Controls are more similar to those of Syndicate though, with left mouse button to move, right to shoot and you can switch weapons with number keys. And your rat is about the size of a small bus. And not unlike in Crusader, nearly everything on the screen can be destroyed. Which is a little something I always enjoyed in my shooter. I mean, the more things that can go boom, the better the fun. It's simple math, everyone knows that, right? Bedlam is a simple but quite fun shooter that the only issue to with it that I could think of are the constantly respawning enemies, which is just a bad game design for most types of games, but whatever. If what you see on the screen looks like fun for you, it may be worth giving it a go. Bermuda Syndrome is a side view action platformer with adventure elements, very similar to cult classic Flashback, but with beautiful high resolution presentation and no rotoscoping in the animations whatsoever. I mean the animations are not bad, just not really lifelike as they were in Ariel Classic and end up feeling a tad stiff. You play as Jack Thompson, a member of US Air Force Strategic Squadron during World War II. While on the mission above Germany, you're shot down by German fighters and as you go down in fiery blaze, a portal opens up, eats you like a fresh chocolate filled donut and you end up on the other side crash landing, in the parallel universe or an alternate timeline. You have no way of knowing. But something? No, everything is not right. There's a jungle everywhere, you're in the middle of it, clueless to what had happened, struggling to gather your bearings. And then you witness a young woman tied up, trying to get loose just when a gigantic dinosaur is approaching to feast on her. So naturally, you help her escape, cause you're not playing Amok anymore and suddenly, somehow, you're a good guy once more. And learn that she is a princess that was left there as a sacrifice and from then onward she becomes your in-game companion. Bermuda Syndrome revolves around traveling around what feels like hundreds of platforming on screen panels, finding and gathering objects and using them to solve puzzles and various adventuring bits. While it may not be as groundbreaking as Flashback was, it's a beautiful and fun to explore game with an interesting mysterious story to uncover and it's well worth your time if you like those kinds of experiences. Braindead 13 is basically Dragon Slayer but few years later and much better. So full motion video quick time events type of a game. Your lens. I mean, you may not be Lance, but Charlie, Agnes, Paul or even Alex. I wanna say Spider... But in the game you're Lance, the geek. And you called in to fix somebody's computer. When you arrive at the address, to your surprise, it's neither office building nor a private house, it's an old castle. So you gather all the courage you can muster and enter. The castle belongs to mysterious Dr. Neurosis, whose name alone should be the indicator that you should have never entered, but it's a bit late by then. So, you fix the malfunctioning machine. Turns out it was Windows Vista updates that botched, go figure. Anyway, as you're ready to leave, you accidentally overhear Dr. Neurosis' plans for the world domination. What's worse, he notices that you did, so he can't really let you leave. He sends his henchmen after you and your only real way of stopping the horror and escaping the creepy castle is to find the so-called brain chamber where Doctor is, defeat him, stop the evil plan and escape in one sweep move. It's not as easy as it may seem though, as same to most other games in the genre, Brain Dead 13 is pretty difficult. And it's a quick time action bonanza and while you most of the time have 4 directions available and a spacebar to solve each of the screens, sometimes timing comes to play. And it's not only about picking the right choice, but also timing it correctly. Still, if you like those type of games, this one's as good as they come. Graphics and sounds are obviously fantastic, but since most of them are video clips, it's not odd that they're of such high quality. Personally, I'm not big on the gameplay loop that it offers, but that's more of a me problem than something wrong with the game itself. So, if you're unsure if you would like it, give it a go, and you may end up loving it. Back to is a sequel to Year Prior's Back and also 2.5D action platformer. The environments are all 3D, but your and enemy character sprites are all 2D, and the gameplay is displayed in a typical 4-2D platformer's side view, which makes for fun but often irritating experience, especially when gauging the distance between the platforms in 3D with your 2D sprite, and trying to measure the depth of your jump with it. It takes getting used to it, is what I'm saying here. But if you're willing to overlook this annoyance or power through it till you learn how to measure the depth of jumping with 2D Sprite, then you will thoroughly enjoy Buck 2, as it's otherwise fantastic. And this time, you're not only playing as Buck, but also his two sidekicks, Superfly and Maggot Dog. I'm Batman. Yes, Bruce, they do sound like villain names, but they're not. What? Well, if you really need to look into them, do it, but don't think I'll be paying for that time. Sorry, his inner detective seems to be resurfacing again. Anyway, Buck is composed out of 48 big levels filled with various enemies and pickups, and tons of hidden areas. Looking for them extends the life and replayability of Buck 2 a little. The story, while not groundbreaking and unnecessary in the platformer, is not that bad, and the voiceovers, while sporadic, are all excellent. 
So if you like platformers and especially those early 3D, it's easily one of the best. In mid 90s, four kinds of games seemed to be the jam, an instant recipe for sales, regardless if they were good or not. So, first person shooters, real time strategies, FMV movie games, and digitized graphics fighting games aching to Mortal Kombat. Catfight, the ultimate female fighting game, is of that last kind. And it's so bad, you wouldn't believe. Not because it features just women, quite the opposite, I think it was the right choice actually and could make up for an interesting fighter, but because it's so aggressively below average that there's hardly anything about it that's praiseworthy. But let's see if I manage to find something. Catfight features 10 ladies to pick between, and they all not only look entirely different, no sprite swaps here, but also have their own set of moves and despite everything else that I will say here, seem to be decently digitized. They're all skimpy clothed though, so clearly the target audience here were the nudity and black hungry teens. The animation is beyond terrible with just a couple of frames per each move, resulting in very jumpy, skipping and unpleasant gameplay experience. If you add uneven and unreliable collision boxes to it, it makes already bad playing game frustrating and tiring to play. But no, I'm not done, and that's not it yet. The backgrounds are as blocky as they come and seem as if the designers just gathered a random assortment of photos and decided to double the pixel size on them to make them bigger and then just threw them in to complete the game quickly. They're unimpressive to say the least. And finally, Catfight can only really be played in 2 player mode, which is not great either but incomparably better than versus CPU, cause CPU will destroy you. No really, you stand no chance whatsoever. Before you throw a punch or two it will be all over for you, drowning you in the sea of kicks and uppercuts, it's unplayable. But can I lower the difficulty level to easy you may wonder? Yes, yes you can. But, and that's gonna be a mind blow for you, when you do, the CPU just stands there allowing you to mold it down without even trying to defend itself. It's a badly designed and developed awful game that for many reasons had to find its way to this video, none of them being a good one. If you're a fighting game aficionado and feel like you should at least give it a chance, trust me and play any other fighter. Seriously, even the infamous Shackfu is much better, while being disappointing in its own unique way. As much as Catfight was terrible, Cats with a Z at the end is not. I mean to be clear, it's just a glorified Tamagotchi, but by god how good of a Tamagotchi it is. It's crazy. Cats, your computer pets, also with a Z at the end, is for the lack of a better description a piece of software for those who'd want to have a cat but for whatever the reason can't. It simulates the furry feline on your desktop, letting you experience how it would be to own one from the comfort of your own monitor. So you'll play with it, watch it chase mice across the desktop, play with yarn or even purr affectionately. It's oddly comforting and the more you indulge yourself the more you get attached to them, despite knowing that they're not there and that they don't exist and are just series of ones and zeros running around the screen. And yet, it's inevitable, you'll fall for cats. One could argue that this kind of software is unnecessary and pointless, but I dare you, give it 3-4 hours and see if you're not going to be craving coming back to it every once in a while just to relax. Sure, computer cats may not be real, yet you still risk getting attached to them, just without all the downsides of having a real cat. And as a cat owner, let me tell you that while I wouldn't exchange mine for the virtual under any circumstances, I would play hell out of cats if I hadn't had it. Or it me, cause it's been scientifically proven that it's not us who has cats, it's cats who have us. Don't look it up, I'm not lying, I wouldn't lie in a video would I. Cats can be run like any other game, only when you want to, requires no time investment when you don't have any and can be even run in considerably simplified form as a screensaver, just to calm you down. It's great. Chaos Overlords is a game that I would have loved to see in real life in board game format, because that's what it is, a turn-based strategic board game that is surprisingly addicting. It's futuristic near dystopian gang war simulation taking place in dark and gritty city divided into 8x8 grid, with each square representing one city block and each of these containing three randomly assigned and games start significant to the gameplay locations like hospitals or research centers to name a few. At start you're taking control of one of six gangs and their HQ and have to compete against others or CPU to fulfill the winning condition. And it can range from game to game and can be a lot of different things from eliminating all other gangs through taking all six HQs to earning the most money or gaining highest crime prestige. No two games are the same. Your gang members can obviously be equipped to perform their shady duties better so they can have a ranged or melee weapon, a single protective item and a miscellaneous one, offering various additional boons. So you'll be hiring gangs, securing protection money from local businesses, looting, researching new equipment and fighting among others. I realize that listening about board game played on PC and watching its slow footage may not be the most entertaining way of learning about it, but trust me when I tell you that it's hella cool. I mean when I was researching it, Batman downloaded it and started playing, you know, just to test it out. And he sunk in completely. I mean he hasn't said anything for like 8 hours he was playing. 
he didn't get up to grab anything from the fridge or use the toilet, he just sat there in silence, occasionally releasing gasps and grunts and fought for the virtual gang turf. I'm Batman. Yeah, yeah, your, your bad gang is the best buddy. Chaos Overlord's says presentation is not especially flashy, but it works, so you'll never feel like it gets in your way of seeing all the data that you need to see. And the CPU is surprisingly competent on all levels of difficulty. Though obviously it's best played with a friend. Chaos Overloads is unlike any other game, so if you're looking for something new and unique, there's hardly anything better, even today. Command and Conquer Red Alert is a prequel to your prior's Command and Conquer. It takes place years before NOT and GDI ever existed and depicts a fictional conflict between the Soviets and the Allies. In this alternate past, Einstein decided to eliminate Hitler before he could even become a threat, thus preventing the World War II as history remembers it. By stopping one evil, however, he unknowingly took part in creation of another one, Stalin's Soviet Union that aimed to conquer all of Europe. Red Alert is still a real-time strategy with an isometric top-down view built on a 2D engine. As an original Command and Conquer, you have to mine resources to train units and erect buildings, but they're your everyday orange gems as Tiberium hasn't even arrived on Earth yet. Gems are worth more, but ores regenerate in time. While building, training, manufacturing of defensive structures, you have to make sure to supply them with power, so the bigger your base will be, the more power it will use and in turn, more power plants will have to be funded. In Red Alert, you can capture and use enemies unit training buildings if said building is critically damaged but not destroyed and you have an engineer in vicinity to do just that. Did I mention Spice yet? Oh, they're a gameplay dream. And work as you'd hope that they would. 007 accent and all, but only in single player, where no unit other than dogs can detect them. In multiplayer, they're visible all the time, so their usability is questionable at best. And this is where we've landed on the biggest issue Red Alert has. While it's an amazing and really playable game alone in single player, it's not as good in multiplayer, at least compared to Warcraft 2. It's not bad, just feels some... Um, dated. But since it allows for local multiplayer skirmishes between two players with just one copy of the game, I'm ready to overlook all its shortcomings as most developers were not as friendly as Westwood was with this approach towards its customers. Clan Destiny was developed by Trilobite and it's very similar to the earlier 7th Guest and 11th Hour games. Same same but different, you know? You play as Andrew McFile, an American who has inherited a Scottish castle and goes to Scotland to claim it. When he arrives though, he discovers that it's haunted by generations of previous Macfields. So, you explore the mysterious castle, solving puzzles in each of its rooms, and each puzzle completed rewards you with a short cartoon movie clip that extends the story of the clan and Andrew's mysterious faith along with it, and unlocks new locations around the castle. While all of the 31 puzzles are for the most part excellent and heavily rooted in logic, not requiring any trial and error whatsoever, lack of transitions between the rooms leaves you feeling a little bit disconnected from the castle itself and feeling as if you were completing levels after levels rather than actually discovering all areas on your own. Still, the 40-ish minutes of extra video footage that the game serves between the puzzles more than makes up for it, and you can even watch it as a single movie after finishing the game. Detailed and beautiful 3D graphics and moody soundtrack contribute to the tense atmosphere of Haunted Castle and add to the fun. If you're a fan of adventure games, do not skip Clan Destiny, as despite cartoony movies, it's not a game directed at kids and can be a fun afternoon or two in its own right. Close Combat You know it came with 176 pages long manual? That's a lot. However you wanna look at it, it's heaps of content. You'd hope that the game is as deep and involving as going through these pages. Unfortunately, it is. So, Close Combat is a real-time historical war game covering World War II and placing you on either Allies or Axis side of the conflict, with all the booms and adversities that it entails. Microsoft used to boast about AI and I gotta say that for 1996 it's surprisingly deep. I mean, if you somehow manage to send your infantry straight into tank platoon, they won't just run into their deaths. I mean, they will, but as soon as they realize, if I can even use such word for 1996 as AI, they will gouge their chances, losses sustained, and will back out in panic running for safety, losing a lot of morale because of being sent there as a virtual cannon fodder. Now, if you have a position them smartly, wait for appropriate moment and lure the enemy infantry into your trap, they will work like a well-oiled machine performing better the more strategic superiority they will assume that they have. Once again, not sure if I should consider 1996's AI as capable as that of 2023's is and use a word assume when talking about it. Anyway, point is, they praised the AI and it was actually really decent. Especially the morale system, pathfinding left a little to be desired, but if you let your units right, it shouldn't be too much of an issue. But that's the real-time aspect of the game. What about the strategy and historical guts? Can we count on them being as thorough? Well, would my saying that the devs responsible for earlier V4 Victory series of strategies worked with Microsoft on close combat put you at ease? Yep, it's stellar too. 
I mean, sure, the second game in the series was better, most of the time sequels are, but for the first attempt, close combat was pretty darn good. There's only few small issues that I have with the game. Most importantly, lack of maps for each side of the conflict, so that you're effectively playing on the same ones, same battles, just from two different points of view. Arguably, there's nothing wrong with that, as that's how it was in real life and how soldiers experienced the conflict, but I would prefer if different battles in different locales were picked for either of the sides. And lastly, which is just my personal nitpick, as it's not really given or included with most games even today, but Mission Editor would be an excellent addition to this otherwise feature complete package. If you like strategies, you'll most likely enjoy close combat. If you don't, then it's not gonna change your mind about them. I do, and I did, but I'm not big on real-time games and prefer them in turns, so I never got too deep into it. Conquest of the New World Deluxe Edition is a historical strategy covering the colonization period of US history. And you can play as either French, Dutch, English, Spanish, Portuguese or even natives. Each of the nations having their own specific bonuses, allowing for slightly different gameplay effects to take place. All nations can also form trade alliances and engage in diplomacy, as you'd expect in strategy like this one. Anyway, after landing on a new world, you have to find the best possible spot for your colony, preferably where it would allow you to grow crops, mine and expand. If you're lucky, with some map bonuses to production too. Features like gems, jade, mines and medical herbs provide just that. You can obviously expand on your colony by erecting farms, mills, smiths, churches, houses and many other structures and they increase your population, income and overall well-being of your colony. City expansion is good and all, but at some point you'll have to raise military to defend your settlements and find suitable locations for the new ones too. Armies, as you can guess, take part in battles which take place on a small grid map with units on both sides and is played out in turns. It may not be the most sophisticated combat system out there, but it still heaps more advanced than that used in such staples of the strategy genre like Civilization for instance. Conquest of the New World Deluxe Edition is overall an excellent and unique strategy that should appeal to fans of colonization and historical strategies alike. The difference between the regular and deluxe edition of the game is the inclusion of the options to create scenarios and to customize the world. New nation bonuses, new special resources and discoveries and trade alliances. It may not seem like a lot, but it adds tons of content to this already pretty big game and makes it even better, so definitely an addition worthy of the deluxe in its name. We just spoke about cats being Tamagotchi-like game and now we're covering creatures, which is the same thing really. Not with cats though, but cute creatures called Norns. Come to think of it, it's not the same at all, as when they grow up they reproduce and produce offspring that take from both parents. No, it's different. Much more advanced, but not necessarily a better game. So Norns live in a land called Narnia. Yes, but not the Narnia you're thinking about. And you start with six eggs, which then you can bring into gameplay area hatch and start playing. When Norn is born, it explores its nearest surrounding and you can use the computer that's there to teach them the basic concepts of yes, no, push, pull, sleep, eat, etc. And then when they master them, you can start teaching them about objects in their immediate surroundings by naming them. Eventually you'll be able to teach them more complicated operations like push ball, pick something and so on. What's more, grown-up Norns can even teach the kids things that they learned from you. After a few generations pass, you will start noticing Norns born with very distinctive characteristics, be it looks-wise or in terms of their personality. And as you keep playing, things will get even wilder. All of which makes this whole creature's aquarium type of a game really captivating and fun to witness, even if arguably speaking there's not that much game in this game. Stupid sentence, I know, but I'm not fixing it in post. Maybe Batman will, but we'll see when it's uploaded. Oh, and you could actually import and export norns, so especially crafty or weird ones could be exchanged between friends both having creatures on their PCs. It's a neat concept, especially from genetic point of view. At the time of its release in the arcades, Daytona USA was a huge hit, or became one a moment after really. It was fast, beautiful and challenging, so a combination perfect for arcades designed to lure you in with presentation and gameplay and then bleed you dry with difficulty. I'm Batman. Sure, Bruce, they wouldn't bleed you because you're rich, but we aren't, man. PC version of Daytona USA Deluxe is nearly as good as the original, offering basically same set of features, so highly detailed colorful tracks, fun arcadey physics that's not too realistic but also not so far off to feel out of place and all of the cars and settings present in the arcade. But it wasn't just a simple conversion, it was expanded slightly so you could play on the free tracks without the timer if you'd like, especially that there were no coin slots on your PC to keep feeding it money. Or were there? You tell me. You could run the tracks in mirror mode, which may not be a substitute for adding new ones, but they felt fresh at least. And you could also drive bonus cars that had additional abilities like not losing speed on the grass or after hitting the rail. This felt a little bit like cheating though. 
And finally, you could also pick the length of the race and there's three of these. Normal, which is arcade accurate, Grand Prix, that's two and a half times longer and Endurance, which is ten times longer and a true challenge. Daytona USA Deluxe on PC was a marvel. If you liked arcade racers and were a fan of original, it was a must-have. Even if technically a little bit behind arcade cabinet that had much beefier and more expensive hardware inside. That said, while Daytona was excellent, the very same year PC got much much better arcade racer. And also a platform exclusive in a form of Screamer 2, one of my most favorite arcade racers of all time. We'll talk about it in another episode covering this year, so keep a lookout for that one. Deadlock Planetary Conquest is an isometric view turn based forex strategy. Forex standing for extreme, excellent, extra experience. Don't fact check me and probably better don't quote me on that either. I wouldn't lie but why would you tell that to anyone anyway. Deadlock takes place on randomly generated maps and puts you in control of one of seven available alien races. Each of them very unique from one another, with their own strong and weak points and special abilities. So one race may be better at science, while the other reproduces at much faster rate or even is well known for having the deadliest warriors this side of Milky Way. It's fun. Deadlock is like an odd love child between SimCity and Civilization. It takes in heaps from both, but is not similar to either. Your ultimate goal on each planet is to claim it and dispose of any other races that may try to take it for themselves. To do so, you'll need to build, manage and balance colonies between arming, construction, gathering and research. And in the true Forex fashion, you can obtain the goal in more than one way. Either by annihilating all other races or by founding a certain number of cities to secure a superiority. And while all I just said may portray that look as a pretty basic and simple game, it's anything but. There's over 30 different structures that you can erect in each city, specializing them for specific tasks you might have in mind for them. There's more than 20 unique military units to research and enlist. And even if it seems like it doesn't go as much in depth in either of two parents' areas of expertise, it borrows enough from both to be deep and engaging on its own and offer a very high replayability. Especially in multiplayer, where it obviously shines more than when it's played against the CPU. If you like strategies, especially those set in space and were a bit disappointed with an earlier similar game outpost, you'll love Deadlock. Diablo. The end. That's all I have to say. No, really, everyone knows it, it's great. So yeah, bye. Okay, I can't really just end it like that. Remember how I said talking about Mordor that I won't go on a long run again? I lied. So, let's quickly breeze through it, talking what it's all about and then I'll tell you a short anecdote about it, but it's not going to be particularly interesting or funny. Sorry. So, long long time ago, behind the tallest mountains and darkest forests, far far away there was a small group of adventuring bards. Well, they may have not been adventuring themselves, but they followed the greatest and most notable heroes of the time, learning about their deeds and turning this into beautiful songs. In time they realized that while the songs were easy to remember and folk everywhere knew them all by heart, they were not the best medium to really portray the heroic acts. So they turned into acting, and it was a huge success. They went from town to town, wore their impressive and expensively decorated costumes, had props aplenty, and they gave a hell of a show. One, two, three, eventually dozens of stories lit up otherwise dark and grim daily lives of people everywhere and allowed them, even if just for a minute, to forget about their struggles and relieve the adventures along with our bards as if they were there. It was great. But same as with songs, acting had its own set of limitations. Sure, it was expressive, the audience often felt as if they witnessed the battles with armies of skeletons or hordes of zombies themselves, as if they stormed the castles and freed the captured ladies from old keeps, but something was still missing. Interactivity. So our bard sat in the inn one night and decided to drink heavily to indulge themselves in the unlimited freedom of thought only liquor could provide and to eat fat and unhealthy foods all day, every day, until they came up with something better. Until they landed on the idea that would change everything. Now, if you wonder how could they afford it, I'd like to remind you that for the last two decades they were incredibly successful and managed to amass unbelievable wealth performing both for the poor and royalties alike. So, since it's been obvious by then that they've been great at coming up with their own stories, after all they've not been on an adventure ever since they've switched to acting, and they did just fine. They came up with something truly ingenious. An interactive tale, grand adventure unlike any other, that would not only allow their audiences experience it, but also be a part, no, the center of it all, the hero who would save the world. Our reformed and slightly drunk creators needed only two more things. A villain more dangerous, deadlier and more evil than any other to date, and the name for themselves to sell the story under. The big bad was eventually named Diablo, and they proclaimed themselves Blizzard, as they were going to bring one on the world of entertainment. You may wonder now, how could I jump all the way from the medieval-esque fantasy times to a little less than three decades ago? Well, I never did. 
as I never stated when the story took place, and words like long, far and so on that I used initially are very subjective. So yeah, there's that. Don't ask any follow-up questions about it or I'll send men but after you. The story of Diablo starts in the small and quiet town of Tristram, in which under Old Chapel, deep into the catacombs, the ancient Lord of Terror laid. As the strength of his prison waned, he's been able to influence the outside world more and more, eventually causing wars and despair, and finally flooding the land with the undead, monstrous and corrupted, demonic and otherwise. There is a way to stop the evil cycle though, and in the process of doing so, to gain unimaginable wealth. Or so the rumor says. Rumor or no rumor, it's enough to bring to one's quiet and desolate town many adventurers hungry for fame and gold. And you're one of them. The most important one, really, as you're the one who will succeed. So we start by choosing a class, steroid-fueled warrior, slim and nimble rogue, or mysterious and powerful sorcerer. Warrior is obviously the strongest physically out of them all and can repair weapons in the dungeon. Sorcerer is the most powerful caster and can recharge spellcasting staves outside of the town. And Rogue is somewhere in the middle between the two strengths slash magic-wise and can see and disarm traps on treasure chests. Each of them offers different set of abilities and an entirely unique gameplay style, even if cycling around the same task so eventually finding and defeating the Lord of Evil. The dungeons are all randomly generated, so no two playthroughs are the same. There are literally countless magical randomly generated items too, and this can be everything from weapons through armor to accessories, and enemies are a plenty and really fun to tackle with. Same can be said about the bosses, Diablo is fantastic. And even if at the time many tried to disregard it as not a role-playing but a hack and slash arcade title, I think that today, after years, we can all agree that while it's hack and slash, it's first and foremost an action role-playing. Especially that the whole genre of countless games based on its formula is called just that, hack and slash. Anyway, while Diablo was an incredible adventure, action-packed to the brim fun title, it was not what made it so popular. It's the fact that you could play it cooperatively online with two others. And experienced in such a way, it was the game that defined the whole decade. You can disagree and consider the latest additions to the series poor, and frankly I agree with the last two being that disappointing, each for a different set of reasons, but the fact remains just that, the fact. Diablo was not only one of the most important titles of 1990s, but also in gaming history overall. And it's as playable today as it was back then, even if we have more choices and arguably better games in the genre now. I promised you a disappointing story initially, so since you've persevered and stayed watching up to this point, here it is. My first experience with Diablo. Diablo came out in 1996, which is obvious as you're watching the video talking about the games for the year. And I'm Polish, which is also obvious as my accent's so sharp that I've heard of people cutting themselves on it while listening to me. Fact. So, keeping the time and place in mind, you must understand that in 1996, while there were a lot of games, basically all of them available for purchase in Poland, the piracy scene was not yet gone. Far from it. And it was still extremely easy to gain access to illegal software. I mean, cracked copies of games were available basically a day or two after they released. I obviously only purchase original games now, and frankly I have obscene number of them today, I think close to like 3000 split between all the platforms I own, and no, I'm not rich or anything, quite the opposite, in fact, I get by living paycheck to paycheck really. But I have no kids, which as most of you know are expensive, and I amassed the games over many years and they're all mainly virtual on Steam, GOG, Xbox and such, so often purchased at discounts or on sales. Never mind. So, it was 1996 and I went to see my best buddy at the time, one that I shared interest in RPGs, strategies and fantasy books. He was an older dude. I mean, I was in high school back then and he had a wife and two kids. That much older. But since we played the same games and read the same books, we clicked fast and spent many years talking about and playing games together and drinking beer, as coincidentally we also shared love for the Amber Heaven too. And on one of those lazy Fridays, I went by to his to see him. As I arrived, his wife told me that he's been playing this new weird game like he'd lost his mind just sitting there second day straight and clicking his mouse constantly as if he was haunted. The scene, as I entered, was like in high school party movies. The bottles were everywhere. It looked like he single-handedly drank every beer local convenience stores had in stock and there were boxes after pizzas and Chinese food all around. Some still have full. And from behind the lazy boy directed at the room corner where the monitor sat emerged a clickety clanking sound of a mice on its last legs, barely holding onto the last few thousand clicks it had left in it. There he was, my buddy, on the floor, sitting in his underwear, crawled up in an odd position from hours of staring at the screen, one hand on the mouse, the other on a near empty bottle. So I sat down too and kept watching. An hour or two passed in silence with no word interrupting the clicking and two free bottles and a slice of pizza later, this time consumed wow. by us truly, I all I said you? was, save the game, I'ma pack this bad boy up and take it home. So he did, and so did I. 
But since neither of us had a CD writer, I zip packed Diablo into what seemed like million individual parts, each small enough to fit on a 3.5 inch floppy. And the rest of the day I spent going between his and my house with shopping bags full of diskettes. I made like 3 4 trips and then additional 2 carrying files that failed to unpack as some disks failed to work and broke. It was a very very long day. But the weekend that came after was much longer. And much more fun. That's how I got my first experience with Diablo. Needless to say, a few months later I bought myself original Diablo and as soon as the expansion dropped, that too. I remember reading about Cyber Gladiators back in the day and learning how great of a game it was, both in how it played and its presentation. The Max, at least those I had access to, praised it as the next great fighter and an amazing 3D entry into the genre. What I'm gonna say here today will contradict all that because I feel that Cyber Gladiators is and was a little poo. Why little? Because there's so many bigger ones out there. Anyway, the story behind it is beyond stupid, and to prove it I will actually quote it verbatim from Moby Games. In a freak accident, Alliance members of the Gaijin terrorist attack were transformed into cyber gladiators, a powerful cyber fighting force. Powerful Gaijin members in prison were also transformed into cyber gladiators. When the Gaijin cyber gladiators escaped from prison, they faced a showdown with the Alliance. In this game, you can fight on the side of the Alliance or the Gaijin in this futuristic cyborg fighting game. Now. How did it sound to you? I've read it like 5 times and I still have no clue what it's all about. Who the opposing sides are and what their motivation is. I understand nothing. Don't worry though, as it's largely irrelevant cause it's a fighter. It features 8 cyber warriors to pick from, well 10 if you unlock the additional 2 that are initially bosses and they can all fight it out on a boring ass backgroundless arenas. What's more, they're not very attractive or distinctive looking and their special moves are not fun to pull off. And all that mostly because of how dark the game is. I can't see anything in detail. Can you? It's not crappy footage faults, that's how it looked like. And the fact that it supported 3D accelerators did not change it whatsoever. It was, is and will be dark. And to me it looks like a game played on a broken screen. If you really want to play a great fighter from 1996 or before, why not go for Mortal Kombat 1 and 2 or Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo. Or even better, pick one from 1997 and play Virtua Fighter. It was a blast. Deadly Tight is a full motion video on rail sci-fi shooter. It takes place in the not so distant future with the premise that aliens invaded Earth, took hold of the oceans and from within they attacked our ships and began process of raising sea levels to drown us out. Now, I like to wet my toe from time to time, same as any other guy does, in the ocean for a little while if you will, but on my own terms. When, how and where I want to. Not out of nowhere and under oppressive alien rule. So, since I can't stand for it, now I won't stand for it, I have to ask you my dear viewer, to once again do what needs to be done. I know, I know, it's another species you'll bring into the brink of extinction, but you'll save us all by driving them off the planet, so it's gotta be worth it, right? What I have for you here is this super duper extra turbo underwater combat vehicle, basically unlimited supply of ammo and Mr. Potato Head trophy if you come back a winner. So, will you do it? Excellent. Deadly Tide is too. Excellent that is. It's beautiful, it features tons of great looking and meaty sounding explosions and countless bodies to dispose of. Sure, as most on rail shooters, you're basically taken on a ride with no input on how to steer your underwater craft, but at least that leaves you with all your attention for shooting and destroying as many of the grey scum as possible. But I'm not really convinced that they're grey. Deadly Tide is not a long game, its story is not too deep and not overly developed, leaving you feeling a bit underwhelmed. But if you like the genre, it's probably one of the better games that it ever spawned in terms of pure fun. Even if it's on the shorter side as it can be completed in just under 3 hours. Death Keep is what I call my current boss's office. It's dark, extremely cold regardless of the time of the year and has that odd smell that foretells the impending doom. But Death Keep is also a first person fantasy action role playing heavily based on Dungeons and Dragons that feels kinda like FPS but without much of the S. Okay, that doesn't sound how I wanted it to. Nevertheless, I don't really know why I said that cause games like Daggerfall or Ultima Underworld shared the gameplay mechanics with Death Keep and I never felt like that about them. So perhaps disregard that one comment of mine. Anyway, before you dropped into the dark world of Death Keep, you have to pick one of three pre-made characters to play as. Dwarven Fighter is strong melee close combat fighter with a very limited in strength, ranged X throw attack and almost no magic. Half Elven Ranger is mostly ranged combatant, spending most of his time pew pewing the arrows left and right and from time to time engaging in a bit of melee combat at which he's not great but also not terrible. He has some magical abilities too but they're unimpressive at best. And finally, Elven Mage specializing in magical combat and defensive spells and he learns the new ones as he's leveling up. He has no non-magical ranged attacks and his melee stuff attacks are laughable at best and an absolute joke at worst. So from the get-go you're given a choice of three entirely different gameplay styles. 
which is nice since the game world doesn't really change at all on consecutive playthroughs. Storywise, an evil necromancer, not that there are any good ones really, or are there? If you know of one, let me know in the comments below. So, the necromancer took over the castle and you have to defeat him. To do so, however, you have to find three magical orbs within 25 huge dungeon levels and then face him. Sounds like fun? Good, but it really isn't. I'd like to retract my former retraction of my earlier comment. I know, I'm messing with your head now, but hear me out. I've been thinking about it as I was talking and I'd like to modify what I initially said. So, Deathkeep is a FPS RPG but with little less and even less RP. So it's FPG. Yep, first. First, I coined the term. I bet Guinness World of Records can't wait to add me to their next edition if they even still exist. I hope they do. Anyway, Deathkeep is not great. I don't really know why I've kept you for so long dancing around the subject, but I won't anymore. It's a first person action game pretending to be role playing solely based on the D&D license and crawling with numerous issues. From poor graphics and sound design through terrible controls all the way to uninspired plot. I'd skip it if I were you, despite it even being made by SSI, cause it may shake your belief in the quality of the games that they released. Die Hard Trilogy is based on the first three movies in the series and is a compilation of three differently playing sections, one per movie. First, Die Hard is a third-person action adventure where you have to scale the famous Nakatomi Tower shooting buddies and saving hostages. So you'll be fighting through 30 action-packed levels and not only going through office floors, but also construction, maintenance and executive levels too. This part of the game is what first comes to mind whenever I think of Die Hard games. You're armed with unlimited ammo pistol, machine gun and grenades. The latter two are not unlimited though, so you'll need to seek and pick up refills for them. The second, Die Hard 2 Die Harder, is a non-rail shooter similar to Virtua Cup. It takes place in and around Washington Dulles Airport and is quite fun if I say so myself. Perhaps not as fun as games specializing in a genre, but fun nonetheless. This second mode also features weapon upgrades and they need to be shot to be collected and equipped. They either have limited ammo or can be used until you get shot. The distractible environments are all around and that's always fun. And finally, third part of the game is Die Hard with a Vengeance, where you race through New York in various vehicles, locating bombs and disarming them before they explode. A strict timer is displayed and running, counting down time to the next explosion, and the game points you in general direction you should be going with arrows. All of the bombs are hidden inside everyday generic side street objects like lampposts, benches, etc. and are disarmed by ramming them. Now, that's a game logic that does not feel like a game design method from 1996, but something straight from 1986 at best. But it is what it is. Each diffused bomb activates the timer on the next one, rinse and repeat. Every now and then you'll encounter a miniboss in the form of a bomb car that need to be rammed plenty enough times till its life bar is depleted. Power-ups like Jump, Turbo or Extra Time are collected by running them over and overall this section, same as the other two, is pretty darn fun. All three game modes, games or however you want to look at them, use a mix of 3D and 2D in their presentation, majority of which is done in the more and more popular but 1996 three-dimensional view and with some occasional objects presented as 2D sprites. Die Hard Trilogy is easy to recommend cause not only you get to relieve the three movies playing as John McClane, but they also play pretty well if you like action-packed arcade titles. Dragon Slayer 2 Time Warp is a follow-up to earlier arcade title. I'm not big on those quick time events based games so I'll be brief here. Once again, you're Dirk the Daring and once again you must rescue Princess Daphne. You'd think that after first kidnapping security at the castle would be heightened or something but clearly lesson was not learned. Anyway, this time an evil wizard Mordok kidnapped her through Wrinkle in Time and it's up to Brave and Dash and you to find and recover her safely. Graphically, Dragon Slayer once again is incredible, being a series of super fluid FMV sequences and simply looks amazing. Same can be said about sound design, it's stellar too and well fitting to the nerve wracking gameplay, which is as demanding as in the original. This time featuring longer sequences that needed to be repeated in case of a failure. On the upside, whenever your input is required, the game flashes in yellow, often even in the direction that you need to take, so that's something that's at the very least helpful and an improvement over the previous outing. Other than that, it's the same repeatable quick time even bonanza from start to finish. And if you manage to pull the whole game off in one sitting, which I doubt that you will, then completing all it has to offer will take you half an hour at most. So if you like those types of games, this one's great. If you don't, then it's not different enough to change your mind about them. Dragon Heart Fire and Steel is a tie-in for the movie of the same title and a side-scrolling fantasy themed beat em up with some platforming areas and digitized graphics. And for once, it's a better game than the movie was. It doesn't mean that it's a great one, but it's not as bad. You play as Bowen, who aims to rid the world of an evil King Ainon and seven as evil dragons. These all rule the world with an iron fist or fiery breath, depending if you're talking about the king or flying reptiles. And they all need to be disposed of for the world to recover. On the adventure you'll befriend one of the dragons, Draco, who not only ends up being good, but will also help you on your mission spanning nine big levels. 
you'll find various differently looking enemies and even some of the dragons. You have a sword and shield and bow and arrow. And the latter duo, given that you have different kinds of arrows, is also used in some simple puzzling. Combat is rather basic, no complicated moves or specials, but it's not bad. Obviously not on the level of games like those seen in the arcades, but good enough to drive you through the entire experience to its very end. And the fact that it's rather bloody also made it more appealing to the youth of 1996 that still suffered from that unescapable Mortal Kombat fever. I wouldn't go out of my way to find Dragon Heart if I were you, but if you have it already or can download it from somewhere, it may be worth a playthrough or two. Drowned God Conspiracy of the Ages is a first-person point-and-click adventure game similar in how it looks to Mist. Yep, another of those Mist-like games. As story goes, we have been created and genetically modified by the aliens, who by all accounts to us must have seemed like gods. So, we were their fishes in the aquarium, effectively having a free room within its constraints and being able to develop the way we please. To a certain degree, that is. As they were historically nudging us from behind the scenes towards certain artifacts of power like the Ark of the Covenant, the Philosopher's Stone, the Rod of Osiris and the Holy Grail. You have been sent through time and space to find and gather them all and in the process solve the mysteries surrounding their existence. That is the gist of it. And if you think that's weird, the full and not redacted story is even more convoluted and often feeling out of place or even like a psychedelic mess. I mean, I think it touches at least most if not all of the conspiracy theories that you could think of, perhaps even some that you never heard about. And by you, I mean me. And just assume we may be on the same page here. Still, this weirdness and lack of apparent direction may be a wall just a bit too tall for many gamers to want to tackle, and they may end up abandoning the game long before the end. Drowned God is full of various logical puzzles, and unlike its story, they are pretty smart and will require no trial and error as long as you give them your full attention. Most of them will be solved as they are, without the need for inventory juggling, which in games like that is definitely a plus. Overall, Drowned God is a mixed bag. On one hand, it features very nice graphics and sounds for the time, on the other, it's chock full of bits and pieces of story that are both tiring to follow and not great when you do either. Proving only that the great game is a product that all pieces of fall into place forming a complete puzzle. And when one piece is too big, too small, or as in case of this game half of them come from completely different puzzles, then forming a finished picture may be impossible. DX Ball was my most favorite Arkanoid-like game on PC, and along with its follow-up DX Ball 2, it probably still is to this day. The game was developed using Amiga's Mega Ball as a blueprint, and ended up being excellent and arguably better than the game it was based on. It follows the typical Arkanoid formula of destroying bricks at the top of the screen arranged in various patterns with a ball that bounces off the puddle that you control. Simple stuff really. Simple, but addicting. Especially that there's 50 levels in the game, various kinds of bricks, so ones that explode, invisible ones that are revealed upon being hit with a ball, and those that require a few hits to be destroyed, among others. There are also numerous typical for the genre power-ups like extra ball, multi-ball, guns for the puddle, sticky puddle, and change of its size to name a few. What I'm trying to say here is that DX Ball is as good of an Arkanoid clone as they could be in 1996. And while some may prefer the classic games from the earlier systems, and I do understand the appeal, really, DX Ball will always be special to me. Not only because it was the first Arkanoid-like game on PC that I would actively play for hours, but also as it was a title I played with a buddy of mine in high school for points. We used to quote-unquote train, each in their own respective houses, and then meet for a, well, let's say non-alcoholic beverage and compete for points. We've stayed in contact throughout our time at our respective unis. And then after, I left for UK and stayed there for 8 years. As I was there, he died in a car crash. He was a passenger and the driver was supposedly under the influence, so there's a sad lesson in that. He was a good dude and he passed away way too early. But the X-Ball always reminds me of him somehow. Earth Siege 2 is a follow-up to the first game, expanding its concepts quite considerably. The war between cybrids and human resistance has reignited once more, and you, being the hero of the universe that you are, are sent to pilot one of our huge mechs, known as Herc, against the evil cybrids. This time, the game features 9 entirely different Hercs to choose from, and even an aircraft to use in some missions. While the missions in Earth Siege 2 are quite fun, the briefings for them are a bit too long and tend to feel a tad boring sometimes. The sounds are excellent, all the shots and explosions are appropriately loud and meaty and really make you feel as if you were there, inside that mech. Graphics are on the same level, way better than what we'd get to see in a more well-known and arguably better Mech Warrior 2. The 3D environment is very impressive for the time and easily one of the better graphical capabilities show off of 1996. Now, with all that out of the way, how's Earth Siege 2 as a game? It's not bad if you like mech games, that is. It's perhaps not as fun as the aforementioned Mech Warrior 2 is, but if it's all you have, you're not gonna find yourself complaining about it. 
The only thing that's really lacking other than the universe that MechWarrior has established over decades is lack of mouse turret control. Which may seem like a very small annoyance, but if you ever aimed with a mouse, you'll know that neither joystick or keyboard could ever compare in terms of accuracy and reaction speed. Earth Siege 2 is a game that fans of the genre will no doubt enjoy, and others can skip without worrying that they've missed something exceptional. Empire 2 The Art of War could be considered a final and best version of earlier Empire Deluxe, so a turn-based strategy wargame covering eras from Neolithic to Space Age and built with customization in mind. It featured many scenarios like Battle of Arbela that took place in 331 BC, Battle of Leopanta from 1571 and Battle of Antium of 1862 to name a few. But all the rule sets to each of the missions could be heavily modified to create numerous interesting what-if scenarios and tackle the famous battles in completely new, often historically impossible conditions. Even more so, Empire 2 included a built-in editor, which not only allowed for creation of user maps and scenarios, which already was a lot of added value, but you could also make your own units, including their statistics and graphical design. It was a de facto literally a strategy game building engine, in which given time and some thought put behind, you could recreate any combat scenario, be it realistic or the opposite rooted in sci-fi. That's how powerful the editing software of Empire 2 was. Other than that, it also added a touch of realism, allowing units to be damaged in the skirmish rather than just simply winning or losing, so being destroyed entirely. There's a simple morale system in play too that can cause units to retreat if it's too low, regardless of your orders. And finally, a reinforcements were added on specific preset turns, taking weather conditions in mind to round up the realism update. Some might consider it a small change, but along with the editor, it was a huge step forward for the game. And while it made it feel more like an engine rather than just a game, it also came with its own big issue. Namely, lack of proper documentation for the editor, which resulted in extremely powerful tool being underused or even entirely ignored by the users, heavily reducing the game's worth in eyes of potential players. Evidence The Last Report is a detective mystery adventure in which you play as Daniel Singer, a reporter for Channel Z. At the very beginning of the game, your girlfriend Sarah Hopkins is mysteriously and disdainfully murdered, and while you and her family are trying to understand what happened in grief, you suddenly become a subject of suspicion of the murder. And as such, you will not only try to prove your innocence and find the killer, but will have to undergo a series of interrogations yourself. And they're not the high point of the game, I assure you. They're long, tiresome and will not add to your investigation in any way other than the time that you waste participating. That said, I understand why they were added, or I assume that I know. It's to add to the realism, I think. Anyway, you've only a few hours to find the real killer, as there are people in high places involved in the murder that will try to stop you. Most of the game is played in a typical for the genre point and clicking with some occasional shoot em up and beat em up sequences. I'm not gonna lie, evidence and production value is not great, the graphics are below par for 1996 and the voice acting is varied, from pretty good to terrible. But, and that's probably most important, if you like adventure games, evidence's story is pretty gripping, dark and well told, so you should have a lot of fun playing it. Fable is a staple example of a good but not great point and click adventure. It takes everything that the genre is known for, it doesn't add anything extra, it doesn't force 3D into its presentation or many twists and turns into its story either. But the staple is well covered, resulting in very enjoyable and playable experience. Story is quite interesting too, even if mainly told in the introduction and barely touched throughout the rest of the game. It puts you in shoes of Quicktorp, who is given a quest by his village priest and must find four mystical gemstones. They are said to have magical powers and partly controlled in nature. The priest plans to destroy them, making the world fully habitable for the villagers again. Each gem has a guardian in the form of a different creature and they must be defeated for it to be obtainable. As you go about your quest, you'll learn the world was once kept in an iron grip by the ancient race of creatures from another world called Mekubar who caused the catastrophic event as they were leaving the planet all to destroy the humanity. It's now up to you to figure out what the gemstones are really used for and can they be a key to saving the world. Now, as much as the plot seems to be dark and heavy, especially taking place in the world that is in ruin, the game is chock full of quirky British humor and for the most part it's actually pretty fun to go through an experience. Interestingly enough, there's actually two releases with two different endings. One of them, the original international release ending, is very dark and heavy and proves that all of the work that you've put in the game was in vain and that everything was not really what it seemed. It was criticized by the audiences as being depressing and not fitting to the rest of the gameplay, so the devs changed it for the North American release not only to be lighter, but also to be a happy end. 
it's hard to tell if that was the right choice, but it is what it is. The puzzles are for the most part inventory based and pretty fun, hardly ever too difficult to leave you pondering on what to do. The sounds are pretty good too, especially the British narration that fits perfectly and highlights the humorous contrast between the light-hearted gameplay and dark overarching story. Graphics are pretty nice, well animated and in high resolution SVGA, adding a lot to the fun. So if you're a fan of adventure games, this one's not to miss, even if it's definitely no one's favorite game in the genre. Fatal Fury 3 Road to Final Victory is the first and last Fatal Fury to ever grace the Windows platform, and it's also an excellent one-on-one -on -one versus fighting game. Out of original cast of playable characters, only five remain. Bogart Brothers, Soteri and Andy, Joe Higashi, Mai Shiranui and Geese Howard. But they're supplemented by five completely new ones, for a round number of ten. They are Sokaku Mochizuki, a Japanese Buddhist monk, Bob Wilson, a capoeira master from Brazil, and that's the most Brazilian name and surname that I've ever heard, then there's Hong Fu, an Unchak wielding cup from Hong Kong, Blue Mary, a blonde haired agent and Terry's love interest, and Franco Bash, an Italian kickboxer. Other than the new warriors, Fatal Fury 3 introduced few other novelties, first being added a third plane of fighting, so you start the fight in the main, middle one, but as you battle your opponent mowing him down with kicks, punches and other gymnastic and often fiery moves, you and them can jump into the background layer or out of it into the foreground one. It takes a bit getting used to if you're new to the series, but allows for a lot more strategy to the encounters than the standard format fighters do. Not everyone likes it, and while I'm not great at fighting games myself, I consider this mechanic to be really fun. You can also control the height of your jumps and block me there, which in hands of a skilled player is just fantastic, for me it's just a stopgap better players would use to counter my attacks with ease. There's also a new hidden ability for each character that's a much stronger version of a regular super special move, but it can only be used once per round for balancing purposes. And finally, Fatal Fury also features so-called fighting level system, awarding you score after each round and ranging from E to S, with S being the highest one. And based on your scores from previous rounds, the game will determine who will you face at the end of a single player mode. All of these add a lot to the replayability and prove how innovative and big of a franchise Fatal Fury really is. But even if single player is fun, the game is best in multiplayer, against a friend, where it really spreads its wings. If you love fighters, it's easily one of the best in 1996 and probably overall in 90s on PC. FIFA Soccer 97 aka FIFA 97 is a fourth football game from Electronic Arts, second using their virtual stadium engine and the first in the series that I've ever played on PC. I played 96 too, but later rather than earlier. It's also historically first football game from EA featuring fully polygonal players as opposed to 2D sprites. At the time of its release it was really demanding title requiring a really beefy PC to run in high-res mode. I had an AMD K5 Pier 133, so a rough equivalent of Pentium 133 and it was sweating digits left and right running FIFA in high-res. For those who didn't own one, a low-res was still available, though looking considerably less presentable. But it ran like a charm even on those stronger 486DXs. So that's not bad, right? David Ginola was used for motion capture and polygonal models, ushering lifelike for the time player's movement on the pitch. A new addition to the series was an indoor mode played in 6 aside format, which while fun was not a long stay in the series. Commentary was provided by John Motson and Andy Gray, and the Slynam was a presenter. Up to 20 players could play online via LAN and 8 using modem. Player squads from most European domestic leagues were included and were up to date for 1995-96 season. Now, let me make one thing clear. I don't care for sports, any of them really, apart maybe from Texas Hold'em Poker. But I did spend quite a lot of time playing FIFA 97 with a buddy of mine over one summer and I loved it. Firefight in development known as New Order was a Polish isometric 8-way scrolling shoot'em up. It was conceptually based on earlier Strike series of games from EA, so Desert Strike, Jungle Strike and the likes. In fact, initially devs considered calling the game Future Strike, but eventually decided against it fearing potential legal backlash. Which is odd as EA was the publisher for the game, but I wasn't there, I didn't witness it, so don't know the inner dealings that took place. Maybe it was out of question. Unlike in most other games in Firefight, you don't play as a good guy. In fact, you're a real life representation of a Grim Reaper, the executioner, the killer, the big bad, or however else you want to call the heartless killer working for the quote unquote system. In future, a Phantom Council rules the world and they use collective responsibility against cities and countries that break the law. And you're the one who's executing Phantom Council's will. The game is composed out of 18 missions taking place on few planets and features 6 kinds of weapons making for a very fun, even if a bit on a dark force side of things shooter. 
Despite the game receiving favorable scores in the mags that it had a chance to sample its gameplay, publisher did not spend any real time or money on its promotion, effectively causing its disappearance into obscurity basically weeks after it released. Which was disappointing as both sounds and graphics were excellent and the gameplay loop was really enjoyable. Music was a bit of a letdown, being very monotonic and not well fitting, but hardly a reason to abandon the game with such a huge sales potential. Interestingly enough, Firefight was sold as a so-called multiplayer kit, meaning two copies of the game were in one retail box, allowing for multiplayer play basically from the get-go. Formula 1 is based on 1995 Formula 1 World Championship and is a racing simulator, at time widely praised for its realism and excellent graphics. It features 17 tracks, 13 teams and 35 drivers overall, and can be played in either 17 race championship season or single race. If you win every single race in the season, however, the game unlocks 18th hidden track, a fictional special circuit called Frameout City, which viewed at the race preview page is in the shape of a Formula 1 car. Nice, even if unnecessary touch. All 17 main tracks are representations of real-life circuits and were made on silicon graphics workstations to painstaking for the time detail. All car models are also unique and based on information provided by Foca and numerous photographs, so they're not just the same model with a different textured skins as it was common back in the day. Formula 1 was praised and highly scored by all gaming max at the time, often cited to be extremely realistic and great gaming choice for true hardcore racing fans. Now, I can't subscribe to this notion, mainly because I've only played it a little and since I'm not big on Formula 1 and prefer arcade racers, chances are I'll never make up for it. But I know for a fact that if you start driving in the opposite direction and crash with any other car racing the right way, nothing will happen. Literally. There is no damage model or behavior programmed in the game for such occurrence. So yeah, there's that. Arguably unimportant, but I thought I'd mention it anyway. Interestingly enough, PlayStation version was much more popular and better scored than PC outing, even despite looking dated compared to Windows port. Whether you wanted to or not, if you gamed in the 90s on Windows, you knew of Full Tilt Pinball. Sorta. As one of its tables was included in Windows 95, the famous Space Cadet in which you completed quote-unquote space missions to race through the ranks and amass higher scores. But that's just one, and the full game included three tables overall. There was a pirate-themed Skulldaggery table and Dragon Skip in the medieval fantasy team. And while neither was overly complicated, they were good solid average for the genre and believable to have existed outside of our PCs. They could have easily been made in real life and remain as playable, losing none of their functionalities. Simply put, they were fun to play and not unrealistic. Full Tilt's sound and music design is excellent and the graphics, while simple by the 1996 standards, are easily clear and not too crowded. Overall, all of that put together make for an enjoyable package. There's not much more that I have to say about it, especially that in 1996 something else was released that was technically superior. Full Tilt 2 released just a few months after the first game and offered a considerable bump in terms of its presentation. Everything shined, sparkled and sounded just that little bit brighter. The tables included cover much more of the screen area and their viewpoint is a bit lower, but it allows for much more close to the live gameplay feeling, for the lack of a better word. And there's three of them once more, Mad Scientist, Alien Days and Captain Hero. These are perhaps not the most enchanting names, short of the first one which is just epic, but they more than make up for it with gameplay. Same as in original or are made with realism in mind, not only in terms of all the bumps, ramps and various other on-table features, but also in how the ball operates on them having its physics of movement simulated accurately. Despite never reaching the same popularity as the earlier title, Full Tilt 2 was arguably a better game. It featured even better sound design, especially all the little digitized shouts and grunts that accompany the gameplay and background music. Graphics are incomparably more detailed, with nice backgrounds behind each table rather than the plain black screen. But most of all, it offered stellar gameplay. Full Tilt 2, however, had a small but quite annoying bug. In some rare scenarios, every now and then, when you least expected it, it was susceptible to temporary micro stutters and freezers. It didn't happen often, in fact it was quite rare, but when it did, it could break your score run in a fraction of a second. Which, I don't have to tell you, is incredibly annoying in a game where precision is the king. FX Fighter Turbo is a follow-up to your prior's FX Fighter and a PC-exclusive one-on-one fighting game. I'm gonna earn some well-deserved hate and mean comments now, but I don't care. Batman's here to protect me. Right, Bruce? I'm Batman. See? But I firmly believe that FX Fighter is crap, especially compared to all the other 3D fighters released in the similar time, like Virtua Fighter or even its successor Virtua Fighter 2 that dropped just a few months later in 1997. But my personal opinions aside, let's see what it's all about. The cast of 8 original characters is supplemented by the additional 2, and all of them supposedly have over 40 different moves each. Though that number is heavily inflated, I feel, as I believe it contained all the basic attacks too. While it may be important to some, I'm honestly not willing to run it to test it out. 
There are also new stages, costumes and special effects and generally speaking it looks and plays much better than the first game, even if it's not saying a lot. Interestingly enough, all the characters got finishers, inspired by the fatalities from Mortal Kombat. Well, they're not really finishers as much as their bloody combos, but they're there and they fill up the screen with blood of various color, depending on the character that's attacked. So that's fun. Is that enough to save the game? You know my opinion already, it was just an incremental upgrade on the previous title and I don't think so. But if you're curious and if you'd like to go by the scores it received in the gaming max back then, then you should definitely give it a go as it was praised as the next great fighter on PC. Gazillionaire Deluxe is a much improved follow-up to 1994's Gazillionaire and still a sci-fi space team business simulation. A remote and historically closed of space kingdom of Kukubian, after 700 years of living in separation, decided to open up its borders to potential trade with the rest of the galaxy. The caveat is, they will only allow a few select companies to enter their space and trade. Yours is one of these. But once again, it doesn't come as straightforward as you'd like, as the companies are supposed to start from the scratch rather than bring in their millions in supplies with them. Despite the requirements being rather unpleasant, there's near limitless potential for profit, so you decide to go for it nonetheless. Your goal in Gazillionaire Deluxe is to amass a billion kubars, a Kukubian's currency, and with your know-how, wrinkled like an old leather couch brain and an old ship and a small loan, you will no doubt succeed. Up to six competing companies will fight with you for profit, so you need to bring in your A-game to win. For the most part, Gazillionaire that's played in turns is all about trade. About buying low, selling high, advertising of your services, playing the stock market, finding best routes and resources to move between the planets. So, your turn always lasts as long as you spend on a particular planet, trading, picking up and delivering passengers and so on. All that could however be done in a basic version of the game too. So changes that the deluxe outing brought are the following. Ability to customize solar system from a set of pre-existing planets, doubling the number of ships you can choose, doubling the number of random encounters, and trust me, this can make or break the game, addition of a new stock market system, ability to choose intelligence level of computer opponents and play by email functionality which was added on top of already pre-existing hot seat option. Gazillionaire Deluxe is an interesting title and if you like business management games or Monopoly as it shares some similarities with it too, then you'll love it. Gearheads is one or two player puzzle strategy mixture that's incredibly simple in its design but it's addictive too, provided you'll get someone to play against you because it's not as fun against CPU. It's as simple control wise as they come and there's hardly any advanced input to it. Most of the strategic planning happens in your head, then you apply it to the game board and observe the consequences. But let's not get too far ahead. The aim of the game is to send out your 21 wind-up toys one by one across the game board that divides you and your opponent's side. Whomever gets to send all toys to the other side first successfully wins. There's quite a few different toys to choose from, 12 types of them to be precise, and they all have their own unique sets of abilities. Some are fast, others are slower, some scare toys around them, some can turn opponent's toys off. There's a lot of strategy to which toys to use and when is what I'm saying. And you'll need to familiarize yourself with all of them intimately to know when to use which to counter opponent's toys and what toy to launch best yourself straight after. And that's why it's good to play at least few games in single player first time you launch it, to learn all the tropes, to see how opponents of various skill levels could behave and what all of the toys do. There's quite a few different stages too and they all have their own characteristics as well. Factory, for instance, features conveyor belts and teleporters, there are mud puddles and rocks in the garden stage and Frozen Pond is ice covered with some areas with cracks. There is a lot to learn here even if the gameplay mechanics alone are that simple. In some way Gearheads reminds me of those modern auto battler games that are so popular these days. Anyway, despite its simple presentation, Gearheads is hell addictive if you have someone with you and pretty good when played alone too. Do yourself a favor and check it out. Grumpy Monager 2's title says it all. There had to be the first one and this is the second, so it's probably better, right? Actually yes, that's precisely how it is. It's also a Formula 1 team manager where you pick one of the existing teams under your wing to bring it to racing glory. Or failure, because things happen. And as a manager, you'll be responsible for everything. You'll hire drivers, designers and commercial staff. You'll negotiate with the sponsors and work with engine, tires and spare parts manufacturers. You'll decide which parts to improve upon, what legal or otherwise driving aids to implement in your cars, potentially risking being caught, but in the same time getting those few extra crucial seconds in each race. And you also test car's performance and will preset it up for the weekend racers. But remember, whatever you aim to do, you have to fit it all within the budget's constraints. And it can be anything from 1 to 10 million dollars, depending on the team that you pick. In short, you'll be responsible for everything short of actual driving of the cars. 
That said, you can give your drivers directions to step on it or take it easy during races, whatever fits the current race situation, track condition and weather. So, if you're into F1, F1 management or just like games that make use of your head rather than rely on your dexterity, Grand Prix Manager 2 may be a title for you. Grid Runner is a top-down sci-fi futuristic arcade maze game, and despite its relatively modern presentation for 1996 in full 3D, it feels really 8-bit, but not in a bad way, in the best of a year away. It's a collab to best action games of years prior and it plays like a charm. It's a mixture of Pac-Man, Shooter, Capture the Flag and Tack out of all things, all rolled into one. In each round you're pitted against the opponent, be it CPU or another player, and you both start neutral. Both of you have to get to the nearest white flag, and the first that gets to it remains neutral and can carry on collecting them. The other, however, cannot do so anymore and his objective changes to getting to the neutral player to touch him. When that's done, the neutral status jumps to the chaser and the roles reverse. That kind of a role change can happen multiple times per game, adding a lot to the excitement of gameplay until one of the players grabs the required number of flags. But wait! That's not all. There are also power-ups scattered all over the grid and they come in three different colors, red, green and blue, magic, speed and agility respectively. Each of them affects different abilities that the characters possess. Red increases your pool of points that you can spend casting magic, green raises your speed and in a game of tack it's arguably the most important resource, and blue increases your acceleration, grip and how fast you recover from enemy traps. There are also time-extending hourglasses and weapon boosts in the game, but in reality it's the spells that are what can make or break your game. And there are five of these. Speed, that gives you an instant boost. Slow, does the opposite but to your opponent. Teleport moves you to a random great eye on the grid. Mind drops mines behind you, effectively stopping a pursuer in his tracks. And finally, build allows you to race temporary bridges and cross between grid's paths that are otherwise disconnected. If you look at the grid runner through a metaphorical magnifying glass, it's a very simple and straightforward game. But despite that, all its building blocks fit so well together that playing it is a pure pleasure. Hellbender is a sequel to Fury 3, and same as its predecessor, it's a if you see it, shoot it kind of a game. So all moving objects and some installations as well should be destroyed when spotted. Not all enemies are susceptible to all weapons however and you'll have to learn what works against those that seem to be immune to your standard shot. So, you'll be fighting on the surface, in air and even in the tunnels completing various irrelevant objectives. Why irrelevant? Because like I said, while Hellbender has a story and there are things you quote unquote have to do, if you kill slash destroy everything you come across, you'll be progressing at a steady pace. It's a bit sad that the story of fighting against the Bion invader took a backseat and his razor fin, but given how much action and pure fun Hellbender serves, it can be forgiven. Because if you start playing it, you'll no doubt carry on for a long while. Perhaps not till the end, but definitely for a good number of hours. And I know that it sounds ridiculous given when we are in gaming history today with VR and immersive detailed environments in 4K that modern games can offer, but trust me, there's something special in Hellbender, simple addictive loop that just glues you to the seat and makes you follow through. Same thing made Fury Free such a cool little gem. Some of that fun comes from energy management, which is divided between the engines, shield and weapons. Most of it you'll use for weapons anyway, and if it depletes they will keep firing slower and slower. And since we're on the subject, the weapon upgrades have to be found and picked up while playing, and there's a nice variety of these. Two types of guns, two types of lasers, six kinds of missiles and a huge mine. Like I said initially, learning all this and what type of enemy they work best on is crucial, especially that there's seemingly countless numbers of them. To summarize, Hellbender is not the best shooter out there, not even close, but it's very good nonetheless and you'll enjoy your time at it thoroughly. Heroes of Might and Magic 2 The Succession Wars is my most favorite outing in the whole series. Well, with an expansion pack that came out in 1997, but other than that, yeah, this one. Why? There's a whole slew of reasons, but to simplify it, let's say that it's just the one I played first and I fell in love with it instantly. I played the first game after this one. I know, weird, but that's how it was. So, this second game is same as its predecessor, top-down turn-based fantasy team strategy with tactical turn-based combat, heavy role-playing influences and a lot of exploration. It's brilliant. Heroes 2 takes place in the land of Enroth and is heavily expanded, fixed and polished version of the first game. It features six types of castles and corresponding to them heroes. So knight, sorceress, wizard, barbarian, necromancer and warlock. Each of them have their own distinctive look, special buildings, abilities and six unique creatures that can be raised and hired in towns slash castles. 
Most of the time, but not always, your aim in each of the scenarios forming the campaign is either capturing of a certain castle or dominating the opponents. The game is composed out of three distinctive building blocks. First being the world exploration map, this is where you lead your heroes around the kingdom of Enroth, fighting random monster packs, collecting treasures, resources and visiting various magical or otherwise places. It's also where you secure mines that will provide steady flow of gold and resources, recruit creatures and most of all initiate fights with other heroes and capture castles. Then there are battle screens, which are hex grid and set your armies on one side and enemies on another. Combat is turn based and sees you moving and attacking with your creatures, alternating with the opponent. Casting spells and overall trying to one up your opponent tactically. There are some limited terrain features which may influence the movement or damage done by the ranged attackers, but other than that all battle maps are identical. And finally, city screens. It's where you use golden resources to build and upgrade your town and its buildings. Where you expand on your mage guild, learning new spells, hire additional heroes and most of all where you get to train and recruit units to your armies. While campaign is incredibly good, well written and interesting to go through, where Heroes of Might and Magic 2 really shines is the hot seat multiplayer, in which you can measure yourself against your friends, all using your favorite castles. It was experienced like no other in 1996, short of some online FPSs. And if you find a like-minded friend or better yet friends, Heroes 2 can provide weeks if not months of content. The fact that its expansion came with a very robust level editor extended its playability near indefinitely. My most favorite custom map was called Gyrus 2. Yeah, like that old 8-bit game. And if you ever get a chance to try it out, it's something special. It feels like hundreds of hours went into its creation, it features literally thousands of pickups, dozens of thousands of creatures in the armies, castles and on the map, thousands of artifacts and resources and tons of scripted events and secrets hidden in various locations all over the map. It's fantastic though arguably not everyone's cup of tea, as it's a bit of an overkill. If you're having issues finding it and would like to try it out, give me a shout in the comments below with your email. Hunt is a spiritual successor to year prior Apache. This time, however, the copter is not American, but Russian. That's not all the differences between the two crafts, though. While Apache was a fast and nimble attack copter, Hind feels more like a slowly crawling over the skyline flying tank. And other than the rockets, there's nothing really that could seriously hurt it me there. I'm exaggerating, but not by much. The game features three major campaigns of 10 missions each, set in respectively Kazakhstan, Afghanistan and Korea. They offer entirely different objectives, different weather and environmental conditions and all require smart and tactical approach. Some even take place during foggy nights where all you really have is your instruments to rely on as visibility is severely limited. Because of the complexity of the gameplay and depth of simulation, it is advised to complete the training missions if you've not played the earlier game. Though, it doesn't hurt to do so even if you have. Fortunately, you can pick between simulation and arcade controls if you feel overwhelmed by Heinz complexity. So there's that. If you like flight combat simulations, especially those with a copter, this one's a good one. Hell, a cyberpunk thriller, is precisely that. There's hell in it, there is a dense dark cyberpunk atmosphere and it's a thriller. So, this time the title actually does say it all. Other than that, it's a point and click adventure mixed with RPG designed by the same team that made Bloodnet that we spoke of in one of the previous videos. And it shows, especially that the story of Bloodnet is even referenced during playing. The game is set in a dystopian 2095 where United States is under control of theocracy called the Hand of God and since it's been discovered that the hell actually exists and the rulers control all the gates to it, all the criminals and insurgents are sent one way there rather than to prisons and jails. You control Gideon Ashanti and Rachel Bragg two agents of ARC, artificial reality containment, agency enforcing bans on cybernetic technology and virtual reality. They're both loyal to the agency and blindly follow anything and all that the theocracy decides. There are model workers and citizens. That is until one night the government sends assassin against them trying to kill them in their sleep. After a narrow escape they find themselves in hell from which they have to find a way out and then uncover the reason behind the order to kill them. It's clear that their approach to how things are run changes from that point onward. As you progress through the game you'll meet many other characters and some of them are recruitable and can join your party. Each of them have their own inventory of items and even if you move them between the characters, if you ever decide to let one of the members go, they will all take what's theirs with them, regardless of who's holding those items at the moment. Hell, a cyberpunk thriller is notable for few things. First of all, it's one of the first games to be released on CD only and to use high resolution graphics along with digitized speech. Then it features quite a few actors with Stephanie Seymour and Jeffrey Holder appearing in live footage all throughout and Grace Jones and Dennis Hopper providing voiceovers. Yes, that Dennis Hopper. Some of the puzzles when completed incorrectly can result in an instant death of our two protagonists. So save often and keep multiple saves at all times. And since we're on the subject, a couple of the puzzles have 
errors in them, so I'd like to repeat once again, save often and keep multiple saves at all times. Hell is definitely not a game for kids, but does it live up to Bloodnet's quality of storytelling? It's hard to tell, I'm not even gonna attempt drawing a conclusion about it. Birthright The Gorgon's Alliance is an unusual, deep and very satisfying strategy with role-playing elements. It combines first-person dungeon and castle quests and adventuring, tactical real-time graphical battles in a vein similar to what you'd expect to see in a modern Total War game, and a complex economic and diplomatic strategy. You're one of the heirs to the throne of Kingdom of Anwar, and your task is to gain control of all of the land. Also, it's A-N-U-I-R-E, and I have no way of telling if I'm pronouncing it right. Anyway, you'll need to do whatever is necessary to win. You'll wage war, engage in diplomacy, use magic and trade real estate, like guilds and temples for instance. You can also set up trade routes for profit and all those actions take place on an overworld map in a turn-based mode. Quests and adventures, however, are played out in real time and they require appropriately preparing for them, making sure that what will be needed on them will be taken with you. A game of scope of birthright is impossible to properly describe in just a few sentences, but if you enjoy strategies at least a little, you should definitely not sleep on birthright and try it out, because chances are, it's one of those games that you never knew you needed in your life. Buster Move Again, aka Buster Move 2, aka Puzzle Bubble 2, is an arcade tile matching game by Tato. It builds on the idea behind the original by adding a tournament style variation on the two player game, allowing you to play against CPU or another player, and branching map in a single player mode, so that you can choose sets of levels to compete in. Other than that, it's still the same brilliant little arcade puzzler. And the gameplay is that simple to figure out, but at the same time devilishly difficult to master. You're in the middle, at the bottom of the screen, and you shoot marbles at the top where more marbles are attached in various pre-assigned patterns. You have to clear out the screen of all marbles by shooting yours at the ones above. That's the whole philosophy behind it. When a particular color marble gets in touch with another one and they form a chain of at least three connected marbles of same color, they pop and disappear. If you fail to form a chain and the marble you shot touches any other, it connects to it and stays on the screen until it's cleared. If marbles manage to fill up the screen to the point where they pass the level from which your marbles are shot, it's game over. Buster Move Again is one of the most fun and entertaining puzzles of the mid-90s, and if I'm to be honest, it's still one of those to this very day. Hunter Hunted is a sci-fi side-view action platformer, and a pretty fun one at that, even if portraying its world in grim colors. The future of 2015, when the game takes place, is a dystopian nightmare. We've been invaded. Yep, I don't know what happened, maybe Batman was on holidays of planet or ill or whatever, but that's the situation that we face. The aliens came unexpectedly, they are here and it doesn't look like they're planning to leave anytime soon. They've also exterminated whomever stood in their way or was deemed too old to be useful, and enslaved the rest of us, and put us to work in their labor camps. I think that we've already established that the aliens are truly nasty and cruel bunch. If all that wasn't enough though, they also run inhumanly violent games so-called Hunter Hunted, where other aliens from the planet Kurati, no relation to Kill Rafi, are made to hunt each other and humans. These games run on lethal arenas created in the ruins of the many former human cities. Our game, and not the in-game game, I know, confusing, tells the story of Jake and Garfi Dan, who plan on escaping the oppression, so as you can probably guess, Hunter Hunted can be played alone as much as it can be played with a friend. In single player, there's 65 missions to complete, with the first few serving as a tutorial. Each mission has a certain objective, completion of which is required for the door to the next stage to open. Naturally, the levels are filled with enemies, who are there to stop you in your tracks. And on top of that, you'll also have to do some environmental puzzling here and there, but most of the time it'll be keys and keycards related, so nothing too demanding. In multiplayer, each of the players controls one of the protagonists, and it can be played either head-to-head -head or in co-op. There's way fewer missions in this mode, but it's a fun one. Only if you've someone else to play the game with, that is. Hunter Hunter uses a few neat techniques for its gameplay and they're rather fresh and enjoyable. For one, there are two 2D planes between which you can move freely, either for traversal or to avoid getting shot or for a plethora of other reasons really. It is a fun mechanic and definitely adds a lot to the playability. Then there are secret areas, usually uncovered by pushing against the wall for a few seconds in correct spots. There aren't as many of them as they were in Fury of the Fairies, but there's plenty enough to keep you pressing all the random walls like a lunatic anyway. And finally, a pretty cool zooming effect whenever entering doorways. It may not add anything mechanically, but it's a nice addition to the slew of in-game effects. And since we're on the subject, both graphics and sounds are excellent, and round up the gameplay package with appropriately good presentation. While some levels may be a bit more tough than you expect them to be as compared to the rest of the game and few others feel repeatable, Hunter x Hunter overall is excellent and I can wholeheartedly recommend it to anyone who enjoys action games. Would you forgive me and accept if I just said that Decent 2 is same as Decent 1 but newer and better? You wouldn't? Oh, 
Okay, then tough, cause that's precisely what it is. Not only obviously, but in essence, if I was to describe it in the only one sentence, that's what I would have said. But if you'd like to know more, then it's also a full 3D all-axis sci-fi shooter with an unparalleled freedom of movement. Sure, it could be credited to the fact that you control a flying drone slash ship of sorts, but whatever, it changes nothing. In no other shooter of the time you get to move in such freeform and natural way. As I was saying, you're flying your one-man ship in a three-dimensional environment, shooting numerous kinds of enemies, both ships and robots. And all of these are different, have unique to them skills and capabilities. Like releasing smaller drones that attack you or stealing from you, there's a lot of enemies I'm saying, and they all require a different approach, which not only keeps the game entertaining for longer, but forces you to adapt and change your in-game strategy on the fly. Some may find it troublesome, I think it keeps Descent too fresh and fun. Same as in First Descent, most of the action takes place in closed-off maze-like in-design complexes, but this time the enemy AI have been considerably improved and apparently can learn over time and even counter some of your tactics. The game is 30 levels strong, with the last one taking place inside the enemy mothership. It's worth pointing out that for whatever the reason, the first few are much less interesting and fun than the rest of them, but I suppose it's to keep them easier, so it's sorta a tutorial-like experience. Compared to original, Descent 2 offers new weapons, new types of enemies, afterburner, energy to shield converter and improved graphics and sounds. So as you can see, whichever words I dress it in, the original sentence still stands correct. Descent 2 is Descent 1, but better. And if you like the first game, you'll love the second. Disney's Aladdin is arguably the best interpretation of the 1992's movie to date. And sure, there was also one on SNES 2, and it was a damn good one, but it wasn't as good. At least not in my eyes. This Aladdin, however, is an action platformer based on the locations in the movie, so you'll get to visit all the cool places found in it, like Agrabah, Cave of Wonders, and even Sultan's Dungeon. And you play as the titular hero, armed with a sword and a bucket of apple. Because, you know, who doesn't carry a vast supply of apples with them, right? Game logic. On your way to the confrontation with the Sultan, you have to get through several beautifully recreated and designed levels of platforming goodness, and as you go about it, you may unlock either Genie or Abu bonus stages. And they're a nice break from usual platforming routine, even if they're not as well designed as the rest of the game is. First is a game of luck played for apples, gems and extra lives, in second you control the little monkey catching items falling from the sky and dodging dangerous objects like pots and rocks. What Disney's Aladdin has been best known for though are the silky smooth animations which are a result of developers collaborating with Disney's animators, and it's leaks ahead in quality as compared to other Disney games like The Lion King or The Jungle Book. For me, however, it was always the soundtrack that took the cake with this one. It's just so good, especially in the first level. The game's worth playing just to listen to it, even if you don't enjoy platformers. Oh, and Windows version is the same as DOS, but in, well, a window. Master of Orion 2 Battle of Antares is a sci-fi turn-based forex strategy game set in space and the title that I really did not want to talk about. Not because I didn't like it, quite the contrary, but because I sort of fear of doing so. It's a, such a huge and iconic game that everyone's bound to have an opinion about it, and many will be just waiting there at the edge of their keyboards to point out all the omissions. On the other hand, it's a game that cannot be skipped in a video like this one, so whether I feel comfortable doing so or not, I have to cover it. M002 is a sequel to the first game, but in reality it remakes it from scratch, fixing what required doing so and improving in many areas to become this de facto benchmark for turn-based space strategies for the years to come. A game that others will strive to become or surpass and hardly any ever will manage to touch. Even to this day, M002 is a definition of 4X, so extra, extreme, exciting, experience, or explore, expand, exploit and exterminate. Both fit as well in my eyes and it puts you in shoes, where appropriate that is, of one of the 13 available alien species, that all want to conquer the surrounding star systems and become the titular Master of Orion, an elusive title that has literally no meaning behind it whatsoever. All that said, if any of the 13 default races is not to your liking, you can always customize your own, which I would recommend if you've played plenty enough games with others. Master of Orion 2 can be won in one of three ways, and interestingly enough, not all are military. First is through conquest of all others, which is quite obvious winning condition, as when you're the last race left, you quite obviously won, or lost, depending on how you want to look at it. Then there is diplomatic victory, for which you need to be voted as the supreme leader of the galaxy. And finally, the victory that supports the game's title, meaning finding the race of Anterans and destroying them, as you do. Anyway, while there may only be three, the road to either will be a very long one, full of conflicts and many twists and turns, and may even make you reevaluate mid-game how you want to try to win it all. But in games like M002 or Civilization, it's hardly ever all about the final victory. 
and most of the time the fun comes from the journey to that elusive achievement rather than it in particular. So you will be responsible for everything, micro and macro managing of your entire empire to the last minuscule detail. You'll manage your conquered planet's natural resources, you build various facilities and ships for your fleet too, you'll explore the galaxy, set out new colonies, engage in diplomacy, trade or even war. And combat is turn-based and pretty tactical. Perhaps not on the level of some games that base their whole premise on it, but it's deep enough to fit within M002's other intertwined mechanics. You will also engage in a lot of research, improving technological standing of your race and utilize these new discoveries to develop faster and better than the others. But it's not all about math and min-maxing your race to the top. There are also random events that happen from time to time, strange artifacts that can appear in orbits of unexplored planets, and even wormholes, allowing for near-instantaneous traversal between far-off star systems. And all that is just a tip of an iceberg that Master of Orion 2 is. It's a ginormous game is what I'm saying here. And if you're a fan of deep and engaging strategies, and even better have at least a passing interest in space, it's definitely a title to steal days if not weeks from your life. Oh, and presentation aside, since it's appropriately simple for the genre, it's still as playable today as it was when it originally released. Discworld 2 The Mortality Bites is a point-and-click adventure game based on the Terry Pratchett's series of humorous fantasy novels set on a mythical Discworld. Once again, you're Ryan Swint, a laughingstock of a whole wizarding world, and you're tasked with a burden of coercing Death himself out of his impromptu retirement and back to his duties. A task and a half, if you ask me. Sounds interesting though, right? Well, it is, and most importantly, it's hella fun. And you know what? That's also exactly why majority of all players fought 2 in 1996. And Discworld 2 was as big if not bigger commercial success than the first game. Obviously, as in most other adventure games, both conversations and inventory puzzles are required to progress and they are as hilarious as you can expect them to be coming from an earlier game. While sound design is on comparable level to first Discworld, the graphics have been hugely improved and are now in full high-color, high-resolution SVGA mode. And if I'm to be frank with you, they look as if they were taken straight out of a cartoon. They're just beautiful, so detailed and so smooth, but... But personally, I like those older pixelated ones better. That's me, however, and objectively speaking, second Discworld's overall presentation is on a much higher quality level than previously. Discworld 2 came out in an interesting time when adventure games were slowly being phased out by other genres overtaking them in popularity, especially RTS and FPS that were the new it. So if you're a fan of point and clickers, seek it out as it's one of the few last good ones, at least for another decade or so. Monster Truck Madness is precisely that a madness. It doesn't use realistic physics, it doesn't pretend to be a simulator and it doesn't really care about the tracks even if it's a racer. They're there, but you don't really have to stick to their original layout. And most of all, it allows you to release your inner monster and just go crazy and have fun. Now, it's pretty clear from the get-go as you're watching the footage that the presentation-wise it didn't age too well. But you gotta remember that it was one of the very first few Direct 3D games using a new 3D subset of DirectX libraries. Libraries that may have been a tad crude initially, but with time a whole gaming world moved to them, at least on the PC side of things. One way or another, while graphics are important, we don't play games for graphics alone, but to have fun. And if you enjoy over-the-top games, have a little redneck in you, just like I do, you'll love Monster Truck Madness. It features a pretty wide selection of courses, from realistically looking to those that border on impossible, and 8 entirely different vehicles to choose from, all appropriately so out of this world. It can be played in either circuit, rally, drag or tournament mode, and if you enjoy physically impossible high jumps, destruction of roadside elements and finding your own shortcuts and going of course, you'll have a lot of fun in this one. It actually encourages not following the track layout but going off-road and cutting corners so to speak, all to overtake the opponents. It's worth pointing out that if you don't like these types of arcade racers or are into simulations, there's nothing in Monster Truck Madness that you could enjoy. Not a single thing. But if you like to give it into a little craziness from time to time and just seek freedom, fun and not accuracy, then it's an excellent title to lost an afternoon in. When Flight Unlimited came out, its only competition in the form of Microsoft Flight Simulator instantly began to look like an old and museum-worthy art piece. A king of the old became a laughingstock of the new. Flight Unlimited was just that. Unlimited. Seemingly perhaps, but to my teen eyes it really was. And it gave you a chance to take a few completely different civilian aircrafts for a spin. Extra 300S, Belanca Decathlon, Sukhoi Su-31, Pitts S-2B and Grob S-103. If you're into avionics, this probably tell you everything that you need to know about the game, but if you're like me, then you care more about flying than code-like names that sounded more like rare and exotic diseases than anything else. 
Flight Let's Unlimited be. went one step further than any simulation before and allowed you to fly around predefined locations perfectly represented in satellite photos based graphics using as close to real life physics as 1995 allowed for. Yes, 1995, because it originally released for DOS. And this 1996 Windows version is really just a port. The game lets you take part in aerobics competitions or even learn how to fly by taking easy but comprehensive 34 lessons strong course. If you're someone who enjoyed Microsoft Flight Simulator at the time, seeing Flight Unlimited in action was just mind-blowing. Today, it's obviously not anymore, especially that we have this new and amazing Flight Simulator 20 now, but if you enjoy those older simulations, you may still find something fun here. Doom came in 1993 and overnight changed the world. It spread like a virus and caused a worldwide first-person shooter pandemic. A disease that for the first few years seemed incurable and nearly everyone fell a victim to. But its software did not rest on their laurels and kept innovating. So three years later they came back with Quake. Many may not agree with the sentiment, but I feel that it may have been even more important title in the history of gaming than Doom was. Sure, it was not credited to be the first shooter or even first modern shooter, but it was most likely the first one in full real 3D. Everything in it was made using polygons and the engine offered a true generational leap as compared to the titles that came before. Sure, early 3D games may have not aged too well, but Quake somehow manages to look great even today. I mean, it featured true and not fake multi-story levels, smooth character animations, realistic lighting model and simulated physics. All this may not seem so great when compared to today's games, but back then it was revolutionary. I'm not sure if that's the ever-present darkness in its level design, gothic aesthetics or grim and scary atmosphere, but Quake is still a pleasure to see in motion. And whenever I get a chance to launch it, be it in its classic iteration or through dozen or so modern remakes, I still feel like a kid smiling at the screen. Smiling at my demise. As I'm not as proficient at shooters as I used to be, but I smile nonetheless. Story-wise, if you care for it, an alien force has started invading Earth and it's believed that they come from another dimension using teleporter gates. A tech that we clearly don't have. Appearing wherever and whenever they please and causing mayhem and destruction. The enemy forces were called named Quake. And you play as the nameless soldier, an 80s slash 90s hero kind of a guy, who after arriving at his home base and discovering that Quake overrun it and killed everyone, decides to take the fight to the enemy by using one of their leftover teleporters and enact revenge upon them. Anyone else would fail as the overwhelming forces of evil are way too much for world's armies, not to mention a single soldier, but you're you and you will win. I mean, when I look at you, I think Batman but better, faster, stronger and smarter. I'm Batman. Mm-hmm. No, I... Yeah. But, okay, okay, so um, apparently I'm to say aloud that no one's as smart as man but is and he's the world's greatest detective. Oddly enough, he took no offense to anything else I mentioned. Anyway, Quake is as great today as it was when it released and it can be enjoyed in both single player campaign and online multiplayer. Go and play it. Screamer 2. I don't care what anyone thinks. Neither you, nor Batman, anyone. Screamer 2 is the best DOS arcade racer ever made and I will defend the notion till the day I die, because I have very fond and personal memories of it. It's a game that I played with my father for months every single day, beating each other's times by just a little and always competing to see who'd come on top. Sad to admit, but ultimately I was nowhere near as good as he was, and he always somehow managed to better my score. Be it by perseverance and just trying time after time until he did, or just natural skills that he had and I never did. It's irrelevant. Thing is, we played it for a long while together and that's probably why Screamer 2 is what my equivalent of playing catch with him would be. He's still here, don't get this melancholy field story wrong, he's just much older and doesn't care about gaming whatsoever. He spends his days either cultivating his vegetable gardens or watching sports, exclusively. But enough about me. Screamer 2 is an excellent arcade rally racer where you get to compete against CPU or another player on numerous tracks all around the world. There are all mainly rally tracks, but an occasional city section pops up here and there too. These not only differ in location, but also surface type and how cars react to them. Which may not seem anything special today, but back then it was really fresh having to adjust your driving to different conditions. Even more so, there's four cars to choose from, all fictional but very unique to one another, and handling entirely differently. Generally speaking, they can be simplified to rear-wheel drive cars being the fastest, front-wheel drive ones being the easiest to steer and all-wheel drive to fall somewhere between the area too. But all that aside, what made Screamer too great was not the choice of cars, 
podcasts or tracks or even incredible presentation. It was the fun that it provided. I mean, if you were to put it in the arcades, mount a coin slot on the cabinet running it and leave it there, I can pretty much guarantee that it would see a constant inflow of coins. It's fast, it's furious, and that's not a pun. It's incredibly responsive and because of the slight rubber banding, which I'm usually not a fan of, it keeps all races against CPU exciting and you're on the edge of your seat. It's fantastic. Screamer 2 supports both VGN and SVGA output and if you have a beefy enough retro PC or run it through emulation, the latter is the way to go as its presentation is literally dreamlike. There are tons of details on the track itself, on roadside objects and vegetation, the cars are beautiful and there's a lot of little touches here and there, like packs of birds flying by or something happening in the background that you would not notice in the heat of the race, but it's more than obvious while watching footage of the game when not playing. There are all those tiny little details, those seemingly invisible touches of perfection that make Screamer 2 such a marvel. Oh, and it also supports split-screen multiplayer if you prefer it to playing alternating, but it adds to the hardware requirements a bit more too. So while I remember having no issues playing it in SVGA alone, in split-screen it ran just a few frames per second and I had to revert to VGA. Whatever. If there's one thing I want you to take from me talking about it, is that Screamer 2 is excellent and an incredible racer if you like those to be arcade and not simulations. Simcopter is an unusual game, because as a standalone title being a sort of very simplified civilian helicopter simulation, it's an average game at best. But it's not just that, and that's what makes it so special. It's a game by Maxis, that other than the built-in career, which sees you jumping from city to city, solving various crises and helping the officials with problems that they're having, so fires, traffic jams, arresting criminals, controlling riots, moving citizens to hospitals and transporting passengers among others, is most of all a game that's very tightly connected with the SimCity 2000. Yes, the very same, excellent and one of the best city builders of yesteryears. All because it allows you to load pretty much any city created with the game in SimCopter and play it. Now, I don't have to tell you how exciting it was for a young city planner in me that saw with eyes of his imagination how cool it would be to fly around my own metropolis, giving it the second life, so to speak, in a different, more virtual environment. And you know what? For the most part, for a week or so, it was actually pretty cool and fun being able to explore the cities I've built and fly around them with one of nine included copters. The missions were varied enough to keep me engaged, especially that you earn money for this that you can later on use to either buy a new helicopter or additional equipment for it to be able to tackle new emerging situations with more efficiency. The sense of progression, even if in limited manner, was definitely there. But few days in, after a couple of dozens of missions and checking out some of my favorite creations, the novelty wore off. And I don't want to counter something that I said today earlier on when talking about a different game, but the main reason here were the graphics. After a while they just blurred together into a single mass of grey and felt same. From then onward I couldn't enjoy Simcopter anymore. Now this may be an issue specific to me, but that's how I ended up feeling, so I'm letting you know to prepare for such a possibility, regardless of how small it may be. One way or another, if you decide to play it for hours on end or just check it out, Simcopter is a very interesting piece of software and all fans of SimCity 2000 should check it out. Out of curiosity, if nothing else at least. Mission for Cyberstorm is a sci-fi top-down turn-based strategy. Technological achievements in the interstellar travel and our drive for exploration saw us expanding into nearby systems. That, however, was not without its cost. In this particular case, it being encountering the bloodthirsty mechanical beings, the so-called cybrids. That are for whatever the reason bent on our destruction. You play as the new commander of Unitech and you are tasked with commanding artificially created short-lived clone pilots called bioderms, so bioskins if you think about it, not a very nice name but whatever. And these bioderms are piloting the Herx, mech-like bipedal robots that are used in both mining and killing of cybrids. Initially you're told that the bioderms are subhuman designed to directly interface with Herx only and without their own will whatsoever. In time you learn that not only they're intelligent and independent but also also capable of great feats, and in reality, created or not, they are our de facto slaves that we use as cheap labor in our minds and cannon fodder for our conflicts. Corporate future, it seems, same as most movies depict it, is really dark and dystopian. Mission Force presents its campaign in series of missions which all have clearly laid out objectives and rewards, so you always know what you're fighting for. Even though they're in large part randomly generated, making each playthrough unique, the overarching story overall is always the same. To be successful, you must not only utilize your mechs to the best of your abilities, but also make sure between the missions to create, train and assign bioderms to appropriate hercs. And most of the time, pairing them correctly is a key to success. 
If you add to it all, literally hundreds of upgrades and weapons for the Hertz to be configured with, Mission Force Cyberstorm becomes as much about micromanagement and planning as it is about tactical combat. On top of all that, the game contains a random mission generator, which should prove useful especially during multiplayer skirmishes, and a complete second copy of the game on a second of the two CDs, so those skirmishes are possible from the moment you lay your pose on the game. Not many companies made the risky and potentially profit-limiting move of selling two copies for the price of one, so it was a definitely user-friendly approach. I mean, I don't know how easy it is to get someone to play it with today, but if you get that person, then that second CD will be a godsend. Return Fire is a top-down, free, always-scrolling vehicular shooter and a spiritual successor to 1987's Firepower. You can control one of four vehicles, a jeep, helicopter, tank or ASV, an armored support vehicle, which despite its flashy name is just a mobile missile launcher. They differ not only in how they look, but also control and firepower. Most missions give you two ways of winning. First, by capturing the flag from enemy base and then bringing it back to your bunker. And this can only be done with a jeep, so it requires agility more than the firepower. And second, is technically simpler and it's to destroy all of the enemy forces. And if I'm to be honest with you, I don't think that I went for the first option more than just a few times. And given the characteristics of most vehicles, so Jeep being good for the flag pickup only, helicopter having a very light shielding and ASV being extremely slow, it meant that I played with the tank most of the time, as it's a good all-rounder. It's worth pointing out that rather than playing alone only, Return Fire can be enjoyed in multiplayer too, and it's hella fun. Definitely one of the most entertaining versus experiences of 1996. And yes, I know that Quake came out that year too. First time I've played Return Fire was from some kind of a shareware slash compilation CD added to a gaming mug that for the reason had a secret folder on it that was never removed before mass producing and that folder contained like dozens of full games that the publishers probably never learned about. And since I've never heard anything about it, I suppose I was one of the very few who discovered the folder and its contents. It was the time of multimedia launchers, though, so I suppose not everyone just went around browsing CDs through the file system entering hidden nested folders, and most just used the built-in launcher. All that said, Return Fire is excellent, and if you like arcade shooters but not shoot em ups, then it's as good as they come. Lords of the Realm 2 is a mix of a game, part turn-based resource and kingdom management, where you have to take care of husbandry of cows, dairy and grain growth, iron and stone mining, weapons production and manage your population and its happiness levels while keeping them safe from external and internal dangers. But it's also partly a real-time strategy where you control individual units or groups formations of units during battles and sieges, offering various unit types from melee through range all the way to the siege engines, with their own strengths and weaknesses. So crossbowmen, for instance, while considerably more deadly than the archers, had shorter range and were slower to attack. Lords of the Realm 2 supersedes previous title in the series, improving on all aspects of gameplay considerably, so that fans of an earlier game will no doubt love it. The overall gameplay revolves around holding your county secure, grabbing new ones, building larger castles and keeping peasantry well-fed and happy, as they are the cornerstone of your kingdom. The kingdom that is also only as strong as its weakest link. Presentation-wise, Lords 2 is a mixed bag too. On one hand, the interface is readable and easy to comprehend, on another, the graphics are a tad behind what was a standard when it released. That said, for what it is, so strategy, it doesn't make too much of a difference and don't break the immersion whatsoever. Sounds and music are actually pretty good and well-fitting, so they're a definite highlight of the game, and to be honest with you guys, I haven't played Lords 2 in like at least 20 years now, so I'm not sure if I would still like it now as much as I did back then. But from what I remember is that the cows are everywhere. It's cows here, cows there, cows all around and also that that I found it pretty addicting. Not as much as Civilization 2 or SimCity 2000 was, but enough to spend few weeks playing anyway. So, if you like medieval themed strategies and don't mind a bit odd real-time and turn-based mixture, Lords of the Realm 2 is a good game to spend some time at. EF2000 was made by the same team of devs that were responsible for earlier TFX that I've spoke about in one of the earlier videos of mine and its flight combat simulation set around Eurofighter 2000 jet. The story background for the game is a hypothetical conflict with Russia that is trying to seize control of Norway and Sweden as a foothold for a complete and full-on invasion of Northern Europe. The game campaign is dynamic and built out of randomly generated missions ranging from simple patrols to ground strikes, outcome of which has a bearing on subsequent missions in the chain. All that kept the game fresh even hours after playing. EF2000 was well known for its impressive and detailed graphics, accurate and true-to-life flight model and very believable sensation of flying in speed. It featured many different multiplayer modes and is just a treat to play against friends or in co-op even today. Granted, I'm not great at flight combat simulations, but I remember quite enjoying EF2000 for a little while. 
Transport Tycoon Deluxe is a definite version of the game. Well, other than the one that came a decade or so later in the form of Open Transport Tycoon Deluxe, that is. But that was a freeware and we're talking about the original, which is a top-down isometric view business simulation slash management game in which you lead your own transport company starting small with just a little money and huge hopes and dreams of it becoming the biggest one in the country. The game begins in the first half of 1900s in the aftermath of the Great Depression. And as management games go, you've got a complete freedom of choice where, how and with what to begin. So, having trains, bus Buses, trucks, ships, planes and helicopters at your disposal, you need to earn as much as possible. Not all of these are there from the start, simply because of how expensive they are and which of them are available, especially that their technological progress needs to be taken into account, and certain transport options are unlocked with discovery of use case scenarios for some of the resources or time progress. In a spirit of true sandbox, however, you can do anything in any order. You can connect two or more cities and start moving passengers and mail between them, very easy to set up, but not greatly profitable. Or you can connect industries with processing plants and then these with cities interested in particular products. These are usually much more profitable but require more planning and more robust transport strategy, preferably involving laying down train tracks and purchasing trains and stations. Different resources naturally require different vehicles to transport them and with time as the technologies will develop, you have to replace them for faster, more efficient or less prone to breakdowns newer models. Transport Tycoon Deluxe, as compared to the basic non-deluxe version, brings in a whole slew of small changes and upgrades, some of them being single direction signals, additional landscapes, which serve as de facto world teams, and a scenario editor. It's an incredible game, and if there's one I can wholeheartedly recommend from this video, this is it. To be frank though, today it's best played in its free open version that's also remade to work on newer versions of Windows. Panzer General is one of the best early 90s turn-based war strategy games and it's played on a hexagonal grid map. It depicts the World War II conflict between Axis and Allied forces. You're in control of the Axis and have a chance to do the unthinkable, succeed where they failed in real life. So, it's a what-if scenario kind of a game. Panzer General features hundreds of units on both sides and takes a lot of things under consideration during battles. Things like unit experience, their strength, terrain and even entrenchment level. All these have to be taken into account when planning both offensives and defenses. Combat encounters are displayed using small circuit animations showing units on both sides attacking and sustaining losses. There are visualizations of games inner workings and underlying math. They're perhaps not anything groundbreaking presentation-wise, but work as a cherry on this already sweet 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 pie of a game. Interestingly enough, Panzer General was one of the very few strategy titles that kept units ammo and fuel reserves in mind, as resources that were finite and could be depleted had to be supplied. Panzer General was a truly amazing title that started a whole series of games spanning numerous other entries, most of which were either good or great. And they were Panzer General 2, Panzer General 3D, Panzer General 3 Scorched Earth, Panzer General Allied Assault, Panzer General Russian Assault, Allied General, Pacific General, Star General and my personal favorite, Fantasy General. Some of these I've spoke about in my previous videos, some I'll talk about in the future and some will probably never be mentioned here again. All that said, this huge multiple title spanning franchise was very unique in one crucial aspect. Basically, all of its titles were good. And that's not something that's easy to achieve over so many games and years. Phantasmagoria A Puzzle of Flesh is not a sequel to year prior's Phantasmagoria, but rather a standalone follow-up telling a completely different but similarly disturbing story. And believe it or not, but A Puzzle of Flesh is actually quite chilling and even straight up disturbingly scary at times. Your character is Craig, an everyday Joe that has anything but everyday life. Your mother went insane, seemingly for no reason, and it drove her to commit a suicide. And your father, who was involved in an illegal top-secret experiment for the company called Wintech Industries, was shot in unexplained and mysterious circumstances. On top of that, you've spent most of your adolescent years locked in closed off asylum. Now, as you're finally out, a grown-up and working for the very same Wintech Industries your father worked for, so that you then thought that your life could be too easy, a mysterious and unexplained murder seemed to be happening all around you. While it all seemed grim and dark already, it's all that you learn in the intro before you even start playing the game. A Puzzle of Flesh is much more of an adventure game than previous Phantasmagoria was, meaning more attention is put to deep multiple dialogue options driven conversations, inventory puzzles and even using phone and reading emails. Second Phantasmagoria's strongest suit is definitely its story building rather than just the action-packed blood-chilling FMV sequences, which there are still quite a lot of all throughout, but they're not the main means of storytelling anymore. If you dig horror movies or games, Puzzle of Flesh is worth every second of your time, and another example of a correct use of video footage in video games.
having it tell the story contribute to the plot rather than being a graphical gimmick only. Virtua Fighter PC, yeah. AKA Virtua Fighter Remix is more like a Virtua Fighter 1.5 rather than 1 or 2, because it features the characters and stages found originally in the first game, but at considerably higher polygon count and with texture mapping rather than flat shading, so enhanced graphically to the same level Virtua Fighter 2 in the arcade was, even if serving largely the first game's content. In my opinion, and I'd like to highlight it once more that it's my opinion and mine alone, before Virtua Fighter came to PC, we had no really good 3D fighting games whatsoever. I know, we had FX Fighter titles and the likes, but in my opinion they were much better as proofs of concept than the actual games. Virtua Fighter PC is a near perfect fighter. While it only features 7 characters to choose from, so Sarah and Jackie Bryant, Lau and Pai Chan, Jeffrey McWild, awesome name I must add, Wolf Hawkfield, another really cool name, and Cage Maru, all of them are perfectly balanced, they have their own weak and strong suits and with practice are viable options for completing the game, if you wanna play it in single player that is. Which don't get me wrong, is fun and all, even if a bit more difficult than the base game on Saturn was, but it's not what Virtua Fighter PC was made for. Oh no 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 no, it was designed to be played in versus, against another person, and as such, it's incredible. I'd risk saying that its combat mechanics are in that gaming sweet spot where they're deep enough to be very technical and feel rewarding, and in the same time not overly complicated, so that the game feels better than many of today's 3D fighters on PC do. It was, and still is to this day, one of my most favorite 3D fighters on home systems. While I always found Pinball Fantasies to be my most favorite 2D pinball out there, the best fit for my personal flipper needs so to speak, Slam Tilt is excellent nonetheless, at everything that it does. The graphics are beautiful and seem to blend all the table's elements, ramps, bumpers and flippers smoothly together, forming perhaps not photorealistic, but a very coherent nonetheless depiction of the real thing. The sounds are fantastic. Definitely among the best on the system, no doubt, result of game's Amiga roots. All elements sound like you expect them to, as if they were recorded straight out of the arcade cabinet in a professional sound studio. The tables themselves are great too. There's four of them. Min Machines, The Pirate, Ace of Space and Knight of the Demons. And they're all great. Designed to perfection with as much attention to detail of their presentation and decoration as there was to their gameplay. I can honestly say that while all tables are not made the same, and there are obviously those that are a bit better, like the Pirate and Knight of the Demons, all are super fun to play, and all feature numerous extra minigames to ramp up those scores through the roof. I've left the best for the last though, and it's Ball Physics. Pinball Fantasy's Ball Physics, while not bad, is nothing to write home about and sometimes appear pretty artificial when compared to modern games like FX Pinball for instance. Slam Tilt's physics are marvelous, they're no different to what we expect from games today and feel as realistic as I believe it to be possible outside of the real pinball cabinet. In the end, there's only a limited number of things that you can say about pinball games without going too in-depth about specific gameplay bonuses and scoring strategies, so I'm not gonna milk Slam Tilt anymore and would just like to point out once more that the most most important thing about it is that it's great. If you don't have a pinball game on your PC or are looking for a new one to add to your collection, this one's among the very best and well worth every minute spent at it. Broken Sword The Shadow of the Templars aka The Circle of Blood is an excellent point and click adventure game and the first part of the series that very quickly gained huge popularity and a cult following. Deservedly so I must add, even if it came out in the time when I was on a few years long hiatus from adventure games. That said, it's one of the very few adventure series that could be compared to early LucasArts point and clickers, so the absolute best of the best of the genre. And no wonder, as the developer, Revolution Software was responsible for earlier Benefest Steel Sky and Lure of the Temptress titles, both incredible games in their own rights. Broken Sword places you in shoes of George Stubber, an American tourist in Paris who after barely escaping with his life after a bombing of a cafe, decides to investigate the clues left behind by the killer dressed as a clown. It appears that the killer only aimed to kill an old man and steal his briefcase. This unforeseen chain of events from then onward will take you on a hell of an adventure all around the Europe and Middle East where with help of Nicole Collard, French journalist who was supposed to meet with the old man, you will attempt to unravel a deep conspiracy involving sinister cult and a hidden treasure. Broken Sword's story is incredibly captivating, the pacing is brilliantly balanced and the overall serious subject and tone of the plot is nicely countered by the humor and beautiful graphics. 
I mean, the backgrounds alone are the works of art, not to mention the character sprites that not only look but also animate in such a quality and style that it's hard to believe that they're part of the game and not ripped from an animated movie. All that, coupled with excellent voice acting and well-fitting music tracks, lends to Broken Sword being easily one of the best, if not the best, point-and-click adventure of 1996. It seems that I'm not the only one with this mindset, as Broken Sword managed to claim numerous nominations, awards and countless praises from both critics and gamers alike. If you're at all into adventure games and never heard of it, definitely do check it out, today if possible. The easiest way to describe NBA hang time to a fan of basketball games who for whatever the reason never heard of it would be to say that it's NBA Jam, but newer. Same as Jam, hang time 2 originated in the arcades and shares its over-the-top fast-paced and action-packed arcade 2 and 2 basketball goodness. And as someone who doesn't care about sports at all, I have to say that it's excellent and a lot of fun. Especially in multiplayer in which up to 4 players can enjoy it on a single system. Provided that you have one of those gaming keyboards that can actually read more than just a few button presses at once. Or external controllers. Each of the included NBA teams consists of only 4 real players, but given that you play the game in 2v2 mode, it's more than enough. But if you've never played NBA Jam either and have no frame of reference, then imagine normal bodies with bigger heads, explosions during slam dunks, ball catching fire all the time, players boost running around the court like on speed and impossible shots galore. That's what NBA hang time is. And most of all fun. So, it naturally does not follow all of the rules of the game to the letter. Heck, other than the fouls and out of bounds, there's not much that you'll have to keep in mind while playing. This freedom from shackles of rulebooks formula makes hang time much faster and fun than it would have been otherwise. I mean, just imagine how much of it you'll have defeating that buddy of yours that keeps winning at most other games. I don't know, 20, 30 times in a row? Seeing his face first lose all color and then turn all red? Bliss. Or is it just me with that kind of a born with a joystick in a hand luck friend? Anyway, not being bound by any complex rules allows you to focus all your energy on scoring in the most flashy, explosive and cool-looking way, rather than worry about traveling and other such nonsense. It's clear from the get-go that hang time was made to provide heaps of entertainment and not even try to appear to be any kind of sports simulator. And good, because I can enjoy it like that, even managing to pull off some of those sick dunks from time to time. By sheer luck, perhaps, but I do, and a simulator would bore me to death. Graphics and sounds are naturally the highlight of the game, looking arcade perfect and complementing the thrilling gameplay perfectly. So if you're in the market for a good time and happen to like basketball, you really can't go wrong with this one. In the market for a good time? I should really think more before speaking, shouldn't I? Because if it sounds like anything, it's soliciting of services of an escort and not gaming. Have you seen Twisted Metal on Peacock yet? Well, here it's on HBO Max or whatever it's called now. They seem to be changing the name on a weekly basis now. Anyway, pretty fun show, right? Plenty of shooting and explosions, some kind of a story too, perhaps not awards worthy, but fun and easy to watch and follow. And it's all based on Twisted Metal, the game. The one we're to talk about now. The game takes place in a dystopian future of 2005, and for a title that originally released on PlayStation in 1995, devs assumed that real terrible things would happen in the next decade. As we know now, they didn't. So, yeah. Take that, Nostradamus, you smelly old morose grouch, you. Anyway, every year Calypso, a mysterious man behind it all, sends invitations to renowned drivers, offering them a chance to compete in the tournament called Twisted Metal. The winner is granted an audience with Calypso and a single wish. Whatever it may be, it is always granted without fail. Power, money, and even things that seem impossible. Calypso, it seems, is more than capable to serve a role of a post-apocalyptic one with Genie. The catch is that the drivers in the tournament fight against each other in a heavily armored and armed cars of their own making. And while the winner will be granted anything he can dream of, the remaining 11 may and most likely will die in the process. Twisted Metal is obviously a vehicular combat game offering 6 arenas, 12 different drivers and practically limitless amounts of fun alone in a story mode or in co-op with a friend. All vehicles are armed with dual machine guns, which while not the strongest weapon out there, at least have unlimited ammo. Other, much better and deadlier weapons are picked up during races by driving over them. Stuff like mines, spikes and homing missiles among others, they can be game changers, so if possible don't skip them. Presentation-wise, you can expect Twisted Metal to represent early PlayStation graphics quite accurately, so not great. First iterations of 3D did not age too well and despite its cold status now, PlayStation was not the most powerful system out there. So the rather simple, blocky and bland. But it's entirely unimportant as the game more than makes up for it with playability. Sonic and Knuckles Collection is obviously a side-scrolling action platformer starring famous cool blue hedgehog and it's ported from Sega Genesis. It is however also much more than that. 
Not only you're getting two original games converted from Sega's system, so Sonic the Hedgehog 3 and Sonic and Knuckles, but also an original to this release mashup of the two, called Sonic 3 and Knuckles, which is basically Sonic 3 but with Sonic and Knuckles enhancements added on. That's not all though, as it also contains a separate so-called Blue Sphere mode, which allows for replaying of a whole collection of bonus levels from Sonic and Knuckles separately from its base game. Fun stuff. Naturally, both ported titles are identical to their originals, with no features changed or missing. None I could find, at least. Knuckles as a character provides an interesting breath of fresh air when played, as he has a different set of skills than Sonic does, so completing the same stages provides for a different feeling experience. Same as on Genesis, you can enjoy the collection in local multiplayer, and while with most games I'd say it's an ideal way of playing them, I've never been a fan of multiplayer in Sonic. It's too fast of a game with way too many quickly moving elements on screen for me to enjoy this jumble of madness at once, let alone with someone else. That said, it's a me issue and not something inherently wrong with the game itself. So, don't hold it against it. If you're a fan of Sonic or even arcade platformers at all, definitely don't sleep on this one. Or do, but after completing it once or better yet twice with both protagonists before doing so. Gex is a side-scrolling platformer that originated on 3DO in 1995 just to then be ported to any popular at the time machine capable of running it. Windows was one of these. I mean, ever since 1995, Windows was, is and will be the main gaming system for the devs forever. It's flexible, versatile and most powerful platform out there and has the biggest user base, even if fragmented by their system's powers. So, Gex as a character is an anthropomorphic gecko that's obsessed with TV, who by unforeseen chain of events finds himself inside the TV world, from which he must escape by completing series of levels, getting to the villain of the game, Res, and then defeating him. The game is divided into five separate different TV channels, which are split then into smaller levels for a total of 24 stages in 5 unique teams. Each TV channel ends with a boss fight. The levels are filled with differently looking and acting enemies and they obviously have to be either defeated or avoided. As per your arsenal of weapons, there's few to choose from. For one, your default tail sweep move attack and a selection of projectiles that Gex spits out after acquiring them through found power-ups, which can be either picked up by eating them and then they grant the skill that they offer or tail whip which makes them forfeit the skill in exchange for replenishing of your health. Your goal for each level is to locate and pick up hidden TV remotes as plenty enough found will allow you to unlock new stages. The graphics are excellent, especially the backgrounds and all the animations that are plenty and always smooth. Sounds are decent, definitely fitting a modern for the time action platformer. So, if you like your platformers that are both fun and great looking, make sure to check it out. The Neverhood is a side view point and click adventure and a very bizarre and famous at its time game. Oh, because of its presentation. But we'll circle back to it in a minute or so. The game takes place in a world of Neverhood and you're playing as Clayman, who, believe it or not, woke up with a complete amnesia. So you've no clue who or where you are, all you know is that you're you, whomever that is, other than said Clayman, and that you're there, wherever it may be. So naturally, you start exploring the area trying to find something familiar, but sadly to no avail. What you will begin finding though are the mysterious discs, each of them containing a part, a chunk, smaller or larger, of a story that in time will start forming a plot, explaining exactly what happened and what you have to do. While there's a slew of puzzles all throughout the game and some are really fun to figure out and even more so observe the results of beautifully animated, Clayman never talks to anyone. He can meet and interact with other characters, but never speaks himself. The puzzles are of various difficulty and not paced in a way I'd like them to be, meaning that the latter don't always mean tougher and they're mishmashed so you never will really know if whatever's coming next is going to be very easy or will it require a few attempts testing your patience. But fortunately, encompassing the entire game humor negates this small annoyance in its entirety. And now, when I think about it, I don't believe that I've spoke to anyone who had anything really negative to say about Neverhood after completing it, and that's definitely something. The most noticeable and specific to Neverhood feature, however, are its graphics. They're magical, looking as if they were literally torn straight out of a high-budget Pixar movie. They're not 3D or traditionally animated though, but painstakingly made in claymation. Each character, each object, each smallest detail or element of the foreground and background was animated using the technique and it makes for a truly enchanting experience. Especially if you realize how many of these little extra unique animations there are and how many reactions to certain seemingly random small actions are animated too. I mean, even clicking on some objects more than it's necessary can trigger animated response. Or whenever Clayman is standing somewhere still for a little while, he will make slight gestures or point towards objects hinting what and where you'd need to do next. All that in virtually each and every location in the game. It's crazy how much effort went into it. It easily had to be thousands of hours invested into animations alone. Not to mention scripting and game design. The Neverhood is a true work of art and not only a game. So if you like adventure games or titles that are just unlike literally anything else out there, it's definitely the game to track down and play. Don't miss out on this treasure. 
Those of you who've been watching these videos of mine and saw the similar series for those know that I've never played any of the Mac Warrior games. Neither the classics nor the new ones, despite the latest even being in Game Pass for free. Nothing against them whatsoever, they're just not really my cup of tea. So, everything you'll hear here will be what I found about today's game online. And I've no experience with it at all. Kinda like I have no experience of being wealthy. But I did read about it online and it seems cool, I must add. Not even the buying of whatever you want part of it, you know, but throwing money at problems seems to speak to me deeply. I mean, you get ill, boom, money thrown and you get a good specialist and a proper care. Your fridge broke down, or even a few disc drives in a span of couple months? Don't you worry, don't wait for sale, just go out and get the replacement. Student debt or mortgage? They're a joke. How about paying them both off in one sweep transfer? That kind of reach seems so cool to me. Anyway, seems I'm all over the place but not here and not talking about the games. MechWarrior 2 Mercenaries is a standalone follow-up to MechWarrior 2, and while original saw you either siding with Wolf or Jade Falcon clans and following the plot set deeply in Battletech universe, this game puts you in a position where you only care for number one. Yourself, if that wasn't clear. So you're on a small company of mercs and your loyalty does not lie with any of the sites of conflict, but rather with sweet sweet money. Whichever of the sites pays more will get your help, support and ass kicking skills. So you'll be buying and equipping mechs, hiring pilots and taking part in many conflicts spread over numerous campaigns. Same as original, Mercenaries 2 feature excellent graphics and sound and hella addictive gameplay for those who are into this kind of a loop. So, if you are the person, you're in for a hell of a ride. Road Rush I heard may be what you get on those overly long 12 or 13 hour car trips. I mean, I'm guessing. No, no, I I've read in a book about it. I never had it myself. Nope, not me. No, 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 no. Anyway, many like to consider original Road Rush as a bad racing game, just because it featured violence. Like that addition would also somehow subtract something else from it just by being there. Silly. But I'm here to shed light on this wrong assumption. It's not the case with original and definitely not the case with this 1996 remake either. For me, the original was the best racer on the Amiga. So chances were high that I'd like this one too. And let me tell you, while by 1996 Road Rush's gameplay mechanics may have been a bit old, it's still fun. If you've never played it though, let me tell you what it's all about. You're basically racing against 13 other racers and neither they nor you should stop at anything to win. And winning is obviously achieved by reaching the finishing line first. To do so however, you don't have to be the fastest or the best racer out there. It's entirely unnecessary if you can just kick the shit out of your opponents. Yep, a strong leg and a fast punch are as, if not more important in Road Rush than the big engine is. Because while no one really cares what happens on the track, everyone does what does at the end of it though. There are five circuits in the game, the city, the peninsula, Pacific Highway, Sierra Nevada and Napa Valley. When you complete all of them, the game will have you race them four more times, each time at a bit higher difficulty. And when you manage to complete all 25 races as a winner, you will be rewarded the so-called Road Rush Cup. Naturally, the aforementioned kicking and punching part of the game is as fun as the racing is, so if you don't mind the odd mixture, you'll have a blast playing the game. There are 5 bikes in 3 speed groups available, Rat, Sport and Super, and as you go through the game earning money, you will be able to invest in better ones, usually offering a considerable performance boost. There's no way of going around it. Road Rush is not an ambitious or technically advanced title at all, but it provides a lot of fun, that moment of bliss when you forget about your daily worries and troubles, and just race. And that's what's most important about it. IndyCar Racing 2 is a follow-up to earlier IndyCar and an incredibly competent and most importantly fun racing simulator by Papyrus. It used all the technological improvements that they introduced with their other game NASCAR Racing and supported many, many advanced for the time graphical features, like high resolution texture mapped 3D graphics, multiple camera views for gameplay and replays and painstakingly detailed models for cars. But most importantly, it reworked the simulation aspect of racing to the extreme. It was so polished in fact that its shine was one of the very few things that could be seen with a naked eye from an orbit. Don't fact check that, trust me, I'm a pro. Opponent driver's AI, detailed lifelike physics and realistic simulation of damage were top notch too. It was an achievement whether you cared for racers or not. Oh, and if all that wasn't enough, you could tweak and customize your car's performance to your heart's content, changing nearly anything. And each, even the smallest of modifications, actually influenced how the car behaved on the track and how it felt to drive. It was magnificent. If you add to it that it featured 15 true-to-life tracks omitting Miami and Indianapolis only, IndyCar Racing 2 ended up being a beautiful and equally as playable simulator. So, if you're into the sport at all, it's worth revisiting even today. Samurai Showdown 2 originated in the arcades and it's a follow-up to the third game. Surprise, surprise! 
Although, if I remember correctly, we've spoke about the game in this very video series that had a number 3 or 5 I think in the name, and was not a 5th or 3rd part but just had it in the title. So I shouldn't really be sarcastic when talking to myself like a lunatic, should I? Whatever, I don't really know where I'm going with it anyway. So, this game takes everything that made the first one popular and dials it up a bit more, improving on the original in almost every way, even if just by a little. The original roster is expanded by adding 5 new warriors and removing Tam Tam. Not a fan favorite, so whatever, to trash he goes. The remaining original cast though is slightly revamped, in terms of moves that is. The rage system has been improved upon too and while it's maxed out, not only the fighters do more damage with their attacks but also can pull off super special moves, which as their name suggests, are super and special, just like you. These supers also break opponents weapons for a little while which is basically crippling when it comes to their attack power. Super special attacks may not guarantee a win per se, especially when fighting against a proficient opponent, but they raise your chances of doing so considerably. Other than that, there are a few other new additions to the combat system too, namely parrying, allowing you to block attacks, low hops, ducking and somersaults. Do they complicate the gameplay as compared to the first game? For sure, by a lot actually, but they also make the game more tactical and less button mashy. So with practice they make it feel like a definite step up over the predecessor. Presentation wise, I feel that Samurai Showdown 2 is excellent, the animation is smooth, pixel graphics are beautiful and incredibly detailed, it just looks great. Could it be a 3D game, like many fighters were beginning to opt in in 1996? Sure it could, but it wasn't necessary and for me it aged way better than most of the early 3D titles did. To summarize, Samurai Showdown 2 is definitely not the best Windows based versus fighting game. That said though, it's way more than just competent and it's a nice enjoyable romp, especially if you have someone to play it against. Tempest 2000 originally released on Atari Jaguar in 1994 and was a remake of Atari's own classic Tempest. It is also widely considered as one of, if not the best game on the Jaguar. This 1996 port to Windows is basically the same game, but, well, on Windows. So you know, the exact same thing two years later with no changes whatsoever. Not impressive at all. They could have added something, anything. That said, and I'd like to make that clear here and now, it still, to this very day, is probably the single best vector graphics arcade shooter other than Geometry Wars. So, the fact that nothing new was added did not reflect on its quality and it's more of a me sentiment expecting something extra after two years of porting. I'm greedy like that, you know? Tempest 2000 is a natural progression from the original, retaining all its gameplay but considerably expanding on playability. The game is 100 levels strong and they're all depicted as tunnels or halfpipes of various shapes. You're fighting off enemies advancing towards you in a full 3D effect and your ship can only move left and right along the walls of the level, so no forward or backwards movement here. That said, those fully walled stages allow for full rotation movement as they have no gaps between their walls. Tempest 2000 may look simple, but it's anything but. It features many different and uniquely looking enemies that all behave differently, various upgrades for your ship and psychedelic presentation which while on entire black background will often blind you with its colors and crazy fast motion. Good blind and not a bad one. Is there even such a thing as being blinded in a good way? I don't know. But with Tempest, it feels like there is. It's a part of Tempest experience, you know? If you're photosensitive, however, I would avoid the game at all cost if I were you, as it can get rather flashy and chaotic. The graphics, mind you, are very simple even by 1996 standards, but their one-of-a-kind neon-like looks, flashes and explosions of light everywhere make them feel very attractive. As while there is a lot of them on the screen at once, you're never lost to what's happening. They like some kind of a modern art that I have no way of ever understanding the meaning of, encompassing concept of its true death, and yet, I cannot look away. Tempest 2000 is super fun, but as much fun as it is, it's twice as punishing. It's not an easy game, it will eventually throw enemies at you from all sides at once in numbers close to all your digits, fingers and toes, and you'll find yourself in a position of no escape constantly. So, from the first moment you begin playing, start learning what all power-ups do, how enemies behave and get yourself familiarized with a bit clunky controls to the point of them becoming a second nature, if you even want to have a chance to attempt completing the game. Not to be confused with Walt Disney's Jungle Book, a platformer from 1994, this Jungle Book is a first-person perspective FMV adventure game. And it's a very, very, very weird one at that. Why? Well, because the game comes with a microphone. Yeah, the game requires you to speak to it. But that's not all. Before you think, wow, it's a fun gimmick, it may actually make for an interesting gameplay. Let me set you straight. While you do quote-unquote talk to the mic, you don't use your words really. No, that would not make you ridiculous enough playing the game. You talk to chimpanzee, in chimp language at that. Yep, uh-huh, so... Uh, you'll be sitting at your screen making various monkey-like noises and I like to imagine you also doing all the scratching and such, cause I would do that myself too. And if there's anyone sleeping at home when you play Jungle Book, they won't be sleeping for much longer. 
Story-wise, King Louis, an orangutan that rules the monkey city, has his crown stolen from him. Now, how did the monkey living in the depths of the jungle got the name Louis, a predominantly human name, also a crown and became the king? I don't know. But facts are facts, it is what it is. And the crime needs to be solved. Especially that he's mad after losing his precious. Now, to restore the kingdom to its original idyllic state, Mowgli and his friends count on you to restore the stolen treasure and bring back peace to the jungle. Because as usual, you're the only one capable of doing so. Naturally, as in most adventure titles, you'll do it all by solving various adventuring puzzles, and in this particular case, also by watching short FMV sequences. They may not be overly long, but there's over 100 minutes worth of them, so Jungle Book should provide at least few hours of entertainment. All that said, it's more than clear from the get-go that Jungle Book is aimed at the preteens and younger audience. The puzzles are not too difficult, the game has no points of no return, and plays more like an interactive choose-your-own-adventure type of a book rather than your typical point-and-clicker. Is that bad though? Nope. And if you have any kids around, the simplicity of gameplay and decent in quality for the time footage may actually still keep them entertained even today. Oh, and the microphone feature is toggable, so if you turn it off, you'll get so-called monkey puzzles instead, which are variation on a classic arcade but not video games, and infinitely more fun than the monkey noise gimmick. Killing time is what I seem to be doing every single day when going to my day job. I mean, what am I doing there even? Am I waiting to get old? To die, perhaps? We'll never know. But definitely, Killing Time. Killing Time also is a horror noir, non linear first person perspective shooter with some superficial adventuring elements intertwined within it. Story wise, having recently recovered with the help of Dr. Hargrove, a mythical water clock of Toph, a wealthy Hayres Tess Conway throws a ginormous summer solstice party and attempts to use the artifact as a key point to the festives. As you can probably guess, things don't really go as planned. As if they did, we'd had no game to play. So mysteriously, everyone who attended the party disappears for decades. Many years later, a former student of Dr. Hargrove, which you'll be controlling, arrives on the island the party took place and must uncover the secrets of happenings on the faithful night. The island, however, seems to be overrun by a slew of various really unusual and often weird creatures. I mean, there are green clouds of questionable origin, perhaps ghosts of former farts. There's also a bunch of skeleton warriors there, you know, the staple of fantasy themed games, two-headed hounds straight from hell, so hell hounds, if you will, Huge beetles, in fact, way too many huge beetles, nude mates with gargoyle wings, which for the sake of this channel I'll try to avoid showing at all cost, killer clowns, because mid-90s, and even zombie bootleggers. Yes, as in alcohol smuggling bootleggers. Like I said, they're the oddest bunch you've seen, and I've only named a few. And since the game world is relatively open, and you can pretty much from the get-go go wherever you'd like, killing time is extremely difficult. Because while you can explore anywhere, you really shouldn't. Some areas are just a bit too demanding initially. And by a bit, I mean a lot. Since over this non-standard FPS Hanksville of simple adventuring, you'll also be solving various puzzles too. All to uncover the story. So you'll be conversing with ghosts, seeking keys and shooting. Which is not a puzzle per se, but given how unusual the arsenal at your disposal is and how weird the enemies are, I'd consider it one anyway. Having to figure out which odd weapon like Ankh, for instance, works best against which enemy. Killing Time's open world is its strongest and in the same time weakest feature. Cause while it allows you to experience the island freely, in any order you'd like, providing for a bit different adventure for every gamer, you will also do a lot of backtracking. And by a lot, I mean shit tons. You'll be visiting the same areas numerous times for various reasons, puzzle exploration and combat alike, which can get tiresome if you're hoping for a traditional FPS experience only. But if you like genuinely scary games with some decent shooting and a dark story to boot, Killing Time may be something for you to try out. Brace yourself, cause I'm gonna try to do something I've not done before and go through this entire next game in a Russian or at least nondescript hard Eastern European accent. So let's check it out. Crazy Ivan is a first person sci-fi mech based arcade shooter. I know, long sentence, but I couldn't have said it any other way. And trust me, it was as difficult for me to spit this string of words as it is for you to listen to them all. Sometime in the first half of the 21st century, so soon. Earth is attacked by the evil aliens, which is a mood statement really, cause it couldn't have really been attacked by good peaceful aliens, could it? Anyway, they've quickly overwhelmed our forces and erected energy generators in five crucial areas of the planet. 
taking hundreds if not thousands of prisoners. Those generators create a field of sorts and it's slowly encompassing the entire planet's surface. And what happens when it will eventually is something we'd rather not know. So someone has to stand up to the alien forces and save us all. Since most armies of the world were decimated, there's not many options left. Fortunately, one of them is Ivan Popovich, so-called Crazy Ivan, and he under your control obviously will repel the aliens come using his mech aptly named Steel Cossack. From the moment you run it, it is more than obvious that Crazy Ivan was not created with death or involving story in mind. It was made for pure, mindless shooting fun. And if you approach it, it's five huge areas like that, you won't be disappointed. But if you'll try to dig deeper, try looking for some meaning behind it all, or even worse, try comparing it to other games like same year Smack Warrior 2 Mercenaries, you'll be disappointed. Because despite the obvious similarities, Crave Ivan is not really trying to compete with anything. There are two generic groups of enemies that you'll tackle, smaller ones that tend to respawn and generally speaking are like ants to you, insignificant and easy to dispose of and bigger, deadlier, which are meat of the alien forces and more often than not are huge sentient mechs. To complete each stage you need to defeat all the bigger ones and then destroy the field generator. To complete this more than obvious objective you have quite a few weapons to choose from, from guns for projectile launchers to various missiles and special weapons of limited ammo, and more. Defeated enemies leave recharges and refills behind along with humans to be rescued, and in between the levels you can rearm, upgrade and replace the shield for your mech. Crazy Ivan is definitely not the game you'll be reminiscing playing for months if not years, but for a few odd hours here and there it can be quite fun. Oh, and he's crazy, and that's always fun. Max Mechanized Assault and Exploration is a real-time strategy, mainly, but not only, and I've never played it, cause I'm not big on RTSs. So, everything that will be said about it here is based on my research and not experiences. Max takes place on various planets that you and your opponents try to take over, by exploration of the land, exploitation of the resources, expanding of your sphere of influence and extermination of your enemies. Despite what it sounds like, it's not an X4 game, however. Whatever. While I initially said that it's an RTS, Max can also be played in turns, which should open its gameplay up to many more gamers, especially those like myself who do not like real-time strategies. And while there's quite a few options to pick and choose from for the turn-based mode, customizing it to your desires and skill level, Max, I always felt, was made with real-time in mind and turn-based mode was just added on top of it. I may be wrong though. The game can be played in either campaign, tutorial or custom missions mode and if you went through the whole campaign, then it's that last mode that will keep you entertained for hours, as it offers near limitless replayability. Especially that there's 8 entirely different factions to choose from, each with their own strong and weak points and specializations, more than 50 land, sea and air units and unusually for the genre, all of them can be upgraded with better armor, speed and range. And finally, there are also numerous buildings to erect and take advantage of, making for a very customizable and unique experience. Like I said, I've never played Max, cause whenever I saw it, it was run in real time and thought of turn-based mode in it made me feel that it was added on as an afterthought on top of already working mechanics. Perhaps it was a mistake and perhaps I should give it a chance. But the more I think of it, the more it feels that it would just end up being RTS but played in turns meaning the same mechanics but with pose. So, unless one of you convinces me otherwise, I'll leave this one for the history books and not reapproach ever again. Master of Dimensions is an amazing name for the new potential human spin-off, but also, and more importantly, an Israeli sci-fi point-and-click adventure game that overlays sprite graphics on top of pre-rendered 3D backgrounds. Worth noting, as it's not a given for the genre, and when done usually ending being an odd, often out of place looking experience. Same here, sadly. It is based on an RPG system of the same name, created by the developers of the game years prior to its release, and focusing on travel to fantastic parallel dimensions and universes, often in different periods of time. So the game's story initially, in its background, depicts an ancient conflict between Merlin and the Wizard of the North. Conflict that Merlin sadly lost, and the evil wizard destroyed his staff, breaking it into five pieces and scattering across different dimensions to ensure that Merlin would never regain his powers. You play as a young dude who accidentally found the dimension travel machine and will use it to recover all five pieces of the Merlin staff, return him to power and save the world. Most likely in this particular order and all in one sweep adventure. 
While most of the game world and its dimensions are available to visit from the moment you start playing, there is only one correct way of going through and completing the game. So, make sure not to get lost in the freedom that it offers. Pick up everything that's not nailed down, as countless items will be required in resolving many of the puzzles, and some of them even need to be combined first before they could be used. So, the more you have, the higher the chances you won't skip something crucial. Especially that it's not always obvious what and where to do next, so having the option to use trial and error may save your save more than once. Sounds stupid when said aloud, I know, but ultimately it makes sense. Not all puzzles are inventory-based and some may require figuring out a solution to a particular problem, usually within a time limit, or even traversing successfully through convoluted maze. So, make sure to save often, as the difficulty of this is all over the place and you can never tell how demanding or easy the next one will be. The dimensions that we'll visit are all unique and differently themed. From dark noir, through Egyptian, vampire, all the way to futuristic space station and anything in between. So, if variety is what you're after, you'll definitely find it in this game. Other than that, Master of Dimensions is a rather standard point and clicker. It's not especially good, but not bad either. It's just there, somewhere in the middle of hundreds of other titles, quietly rotting away from existence. So unless you've nothing else to play, I doubt that you will ever go out of your way to complete this one. Meridian 59 is one mistake away from being a legend. If it was called Meridian 69, not only it would be better remembered today, but we'd also have much more fun playing it back then. But cringe jokes aside, Meridian 59 is one of the very first 3D MMORPGs. Presentation-wise, Meridian didn't look great when it released, and it definitely doesn't look any better now either. But its engine's simplicity can be most likely attributed to the internet speed constraints of the time it released in, as most people were still using dial-up connections of questionable speed and stability. So the processing power that would be spent on presentation went into sending, receiving and uncompressing amounts of data sent over the phone lines. Same reason why sounds and music design was that limited too. Pleasant, but limited. As in other MMOs, first person or not, Meridian is all about creating your player and then having him go on thousands of adventures, often of a repeatable nature, getting better, stronger and more powerful and having fun with others. All because majority of characters that you'll meet in the game are other people. All that said, Meridian 59 is not a game for an odd hour or two every few days or a week even. To be able to fully enjoy it, appreciate its huge world lore quests and adventures, it requires a considerable commitment, in terms of both time and effort. In this, it doesn't differ that much from MMOs of today. With one notable difference, that is, it requires no monthly payment and has no microtransactions, other than the initial purchase, that is. Which sadly is something virtually unheard of today. Meridian 59's time of glory is long gone, years ago in fact, and while it can still be played today, in huge part thanks to a Steam re-release, I question the scope of its player base today. Is it big enough to warrant a return to this classic? Is it feature-rich and feels comfortable enough to satisfy a modern user? Well, honestly, I don't think I'll be checking. I have plenty on my plate already, hardly any time for myself, and adding an MMORPG, even an older one to all that, is just not something I'm prepared for. But if you're someone who can invest some time every day in an ongoing adventure that's one of a kind, or at least was like it in its heyday, then it may be worth for them to give Meridian 59 at least a passing look. Necrodom is a little like Twisted Metal, but with less engaging story and worse gameplay. In essence, it's a first-person futuristic driving arcade shooter. Note that I did not use the word racer, because it's not about racing at all in Necrodome. It's more capture the flag type of a deal here. So, you're driving around over 30 different arenas in heavily armed and armored vehicle, annihilating anyone else that you meet. Well, you can technically always try to find a flag that's usually in a locked off area somewhere and then get it back to your starting position. But it's not as fun as killing everyone else's. Oh, and dear YouTube deities, please hear me out. I meant killing in an in-game meaning only and had nothing else in mind. Forgive me, please and thank you. Your enemies will consist of eight different types of other vehicles and flying and foot soldiers. All obviously should be disposed of, preferably in style. Because knowing you, you even do your killings in style. It can be done with your car, or alternatively, you can step out of it and run around on foot, which may make some of these hard to reach for a vehicle areas more accessible, but you're also in open and less resistant to any incoming damage. Necrodome is not bad, but it's also a bit tedious, as all you really do in each of the boring as flat and semi looking arenas is chase down the switches that open locked off areas, search for hidden flags, and fight against various enemies. And don't get me wrong, all that is fun in a limited degree, but it's not fun enough to warrant games longer stay, as it's not especially varied or entertaining. So, if you're into mindless shooters every once in a while, Necrodome may be perfect. 
but if you look for something deeper, look somewhere else. Space Hulk Vengeance of the Blood Angels is a first-person tactical horror team shooter. Not as in monsters, vampires, werewolves and such horror, but as in aliens, the overwhelming feeling of loneliness and death creeping from behind every corner kind of a horror. I hope you get what I mean. It is based on Warhammer 40k universe and it's a follow-up to 1993's first Space Hulk. And for the most part, it actually plays very similar too, but looks much, much better and features less loadings. Well, I played the first on the Amiga, so perhaps it did not load too much on PC either. I have no way of telling you. Vengeance is as difficult and nerve-wracking as the predecessor, so fans of original will love this one too. Or hate it, because it's one of those games that you love only because you hate it. It depicts the struggle of Terminators of the Blood Angels chapter of Space Marines against the Tyranid Gene Stealers. The game is a mixture of tactical planning and first-person shooting. So while you can control even up to 10 Terminators, issuing them orders on a tactical screen, when you jump into any of them to assume control, you are moving and fighting in 3D environments. Not unlike the ones you would find in any other FPS. Albeit in a maze of only 90 degrees turning corridors similar to those in earlier dungeon crawling RPGs. The simplified map, however, does not take away from the atmosphere of dread-inducing dark corridors that you'll be traversing through, emanating vibes of some kind of ancient space gothic churches, temples and castles. Seriously, the design of the environments is one of the kind here. Most prominent in those larger open areas though, where high ceilings can be 2, 3, even 4 floors up which coincidentally are also areas where it's the easiest for your team to die. Because in Space Hulk, this or earlier for that matter too, you have to have eyes all around your head. As while your weapons are rather strong, they only are on a distance. In close combat, when you're unexpectedly attacked from behind, it's surprisingly easy to die. So Space Hulk is a game where each, even the smallest and seemingly most insignificant error may be a difference between life and death. Keep that in mind. Oh, and while all that seems like a lot and seriously complicated title, Keep in mind that unlike the first game, you get to control other marines in the second after completing few easier missions first, so that it gives you plenty enough time to get used to everything that it has to offer. And sadly, that's the game's worst point too, that by the time you get to issue those orders, you pretty much saw most of the content in the game. And while the future missions will be more demanding, the scary stuff scarier, hardly anything new will surprise you gameplay-wise. Probably because it was based on the board game. So, if that's an issue for you, avoid Vengeance. It's not a game you'll enjoy. If not, then better have a pair of spare trousers just in case within the arms reach, as the ones you're wearing may not be enough after third, fourth or fifth time Gene Stalkers surprise you jumping from seemingly nowhere and attacking from behind. I love Star Trek. I love everything that it stands for. The near utopian earth, the urge for discovery and learning new things about the universe, other races and various kinds of phenomena, the peace striving attitude and solution focused approach to problems big and small, rather than the one that we often employ in our real world, so searching for those responsible and not solutions, which is the worst kind of problem solving that there is. But I digress. Star Trek as a whole, in my eyes, is a gem of creativity and a goal that we as a species should aim for, to become humans, earthlings and not smaller nations constantly involved in conflict and wars as we are now. So, naturally, whenever there's a new Star Trek game, I have to try it out. For instance, two days ago I completed Star Trek Resurgence, a few months only old game perhaps, and chock full of little technical annoyances too, but interesting and involving story nonetheless. So I've played most of Star Trek games is what I'm saying here. But I've never played Star Trek Borg. In fact, I've never even heard of it until a couple months ago when I've made a list of Windows games to cover for 1996. So, naturally, while I pride myself on loving the universe, all I will tell you about it will be based on my research and not experiences. That said, I may revisit the preview in the future video, as I will be definitely getting my bony human pose on this one, when slash if I get a chance. Star Trek Borg is a first-person perspective FMV point-and-click adventure. You play as a young Starfleet cadet whose father died in the historical battle against the Borg at Wolf 359. Naturally, a traumatizing event for a child and a good starting off point for a Starfleet career. Now, as a grown-up, you're a witness to Spark that's the beginning of another potential deadly Borg conflict. Starfleet, however, given your emotional trauma, refuses your involvement. Enter Q. Masterfully replayed by John Delancey himself, Q gives you the opportunity to do one better than help in this current conflict. He offers you a chance to travel back in time to the Battle of Wolf 359 and save your father. And since Q is omnipowerful, it's not empty words, it's a real opportunity. Star Trek Borg is a first-person perspective type of a game, so you're basically taking part in an interactive movie as it plays out. 
Initially as a cadet on the bridge of your father's ship and as you play you will be making a lot of important, often irreversible decisions and solving some in-team puzzles. In time you'll be transferred into bridge security officer's body to potentially change seemingly inevitable outcome of the battle. Interestingly enough the game allows you to pause the footage at any given point, pull out your tricorder and inspect everything that's on the screen. And when you do, Q provides the narration describing objects and characters that you scan. It's a fun concept that all fans of the Star Trek universe will no doubt appreciate. Many of the FMV games are terrible, and I'm aware that this one has the potential to be one of them too, but I'm full of hope that it's not, and will definitely be trying to play it on my own to experience in full what it has to offer. And as such, I cannot give you a recommendation or suggest skipping it, as I'm not really even remotely familiar with it yet. Total Mayhem aka Total Mania is a bit disappointing isometric action shooter. Not disappointing because it's bad, it just aims to do so much and not really delivers. Overcomplicating the gameplay in the process. The plot is kinda spot on with what we're worrying about now in real world, so AI, well not me but some are, a Terminator adjacent scenario to be precise. So in the year 2140 the human race has been enslaved by the machines. Originally built to wage our wars, the machines outgrew us in strength, intelligence, everything and took over. Like I said, a very Terminator-like future. As years have passed and we're kept locked off barely surviving, some begin to mount a resistance, begin to fight back, recreating cyborgs using the very same technology that enslaved us, crafting warriors for our freedom. You are leading a small group of set cyborgs in a campaign composed of numerous missions, each with their own objective. If you ever played any of the Crusader games, you'll feel right at home in Total Mayhem. It's also an isometric action shooter, also features tons of enemies and destructible environments, the latter to a certain degree and has some very simple environmental puzzling, focusing mainly on finding hidden entrances, keys for locked off doors and areas and the likes. As you go through the game you'll gain access to better and stronger weaponry, but naturally in response to that your enemies will become more challenging too, and you're giving a control of up to 6 cyborgs at once. Now, while it's fun and all, switching between them in the easier, earlier missions, in time it will become troublesome, as those cyborgs that you don't actively control at any given moment just stand there like silly potatoes waiting to be shot by the enemy forces, having no AI to them at all. So the further you get in the game, the more chaotic the missions will be and more often you'll need to switch between your units, which, while a novel concept, gets tiresome real fast, and the game would benefit from a singular protagonist like in Crusader much more. All that said, if you enjoy action shooters and don't mind moments of panic inducing switching between many cyborgs trying to save them all at the same time, Total Mayhem is actually pretty fun and may provide an hour or two here and there of explosive fun. I wasn't fully aware of it getting into the year initially, but 1996 was truly incredible for Windows. Not only DirectX was in full swing, but Dev started releasing excellent original and ported titles and even ultimate versions of previously DOS-only releases. It was a year of progress, it was a year of games, it was a year of fun. What do you think of the games that we've went through so far though? Do you think any of the later years will be able to give 1996 run for its money? Let me know in the comments below. Oh, and so I won't forget, the compilation video rolling all separate episodes covering the year into one should be out very soon. If you like the video, hit those like and subscribe buttons below. Smash them if you have to, it helps more than you could ever know. Also, I would like to thank you and all my amazing Patreon and YouTube members for helping this channel keep going. And last but definitely not least, I would like to thank all the wonderful folks who record and upload playthroughs, let's plays and other retrocentric videos here on YouTube, because they help to preserve the games that would have otherwise belong forgotten. So thank you.